that you're all that you're going to be hearing today is uh, going to be also in our Utah Women's Health Review. This is a publication which is digital in conjunction with Eccles Health Sciences Library Digital Publishing, where we feature Utah Women's Health. It's a peer-reviewed journal uh, that reflects really our one U view uh, and we follow the seven domains of health, meaning that we believe that there are many determinants of health. It's an ideal place for your students, residents, fellows, faculty to publish research. And, uh, and really, if they have anything to do with the Utah population or sex and gender medicine or women's health, we welcome your submissions. Um, our editor, Karen Schleep, Dr. Karen Schleep, uh, and the editorial board review these uh, papers and all of our manuscripts are pu published. The proceedings for today will also be published uh, in abstract form and video format. And we do this uh, every year. I want you to be aware that we're, we've pre-recorded the talk so that there are no glitches or a few glitches, as few glitches as possible, but we have live Q and A except for one talk. Uh, I would also encourage you to put your questions in the chat and the moderators will be viewing the questions and then asking uh, in the Q&A time. We do have a couple breaks in the session, uh, bio breaks, uh, but also time that you can visit the posters again because these are really excellent. I just wanna thank all of you for attending. We have over 122 people registered today. So you're gonna be seeing a lot of folks coming and going today and we welcome you so warmly. Our, our first session is going to be on mental health, uh, another hot topic. And our first speaker unfortunately has a conflict and cannot be here for the live Q and A, but he is graciously, <clears throat> given his time to record a wonderful talk. It's Dr. Mark uh, Rappaport. He's our new uh, chairman of psychiatry and the CEO of the Huntsman Mental Health Institute. And he's also served as the Stimson Presidential Endowed Chair here at the University of Utah. We are very lucky to get Dr. Rappaport. He's I was the chair of uh, psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Emory University. And before that, he was the chair at Cedars-Sinai. He served on numerous panels. He has over 200 publications. But his research is so interesting because it focuses on human psychoneuroimmunology, psychopharmacology, and clinical trials and methodology, as well as complementary and alternative medicine. Uh, so we are thrilled to have Dr. Rappaport be our leadoff speaker to talk about inflammatory depression and women. So thank you, Dr. Rappaport, for uh, joining us virtually today. Hello, I'm Mark Rappaport, and it's a pleasure to be asked to speak with you about some of our work looking at sex differences and depression, in particular focusing on um, a new approach to treatment with omega-3 fatty acids. I apologize, I can't be with you in person today. And so what I'd like to do is, is talk with you a little bit about our research investigating sex differences in omega-3 fatty acid response in individuals with major depressive disorder and high levels of inflammation. As you know, uh, inflammation has now been associated with many diseases, including heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, and of course, um, depressive disorder. But one of the things that's really important to recognize is that uh, acute inflammation is a normal and necessary adaptive uh, response. And it helps us with um, many different types of insults. It's also normal and necessary for things such as the implementation um, of, the, um, of the egg. However, what's problematic is a chronic inflammatory process, which tends to be destructive in many ways and also shifts our energy utilization. Um, 
If we look at inflammation in the brain, what we know is that a variety of different external factors, be it um, chronic inflammatory illnesses, exogenous cytokine production, cancer, and stress, will increase um, peripheral cytokines. And these increases in peripheral cytokines have central effects in terms of anhedonia, cognitive problems, fatigue, and dis depressed mood, as well as pain. Um, what we also know is that there are sex differences in terms of the immune system and immune response, with women having a stronger immune response than men. Um, so women um, more swiftly recover from in infectious diseases, have greater efficacy of vaccines, and, and better cancer survival. But the disadvantage is that, that women are also um, more likely to have um, higher expression of pro-inflammatory genes and higher levels of inflammatory cytokines. And um, as you see here, um, a greater prevalence of um, a variety of autoimmune disorders, be it Sjogren syndrome or SLE or autoimmune thyroid disease or scler scleroderma, just to name a few. So we see true sex differences in terms of autoimmune diseases with women versus men. If we look at sex differences in depressive disorder, what one sees again is that um, men and women are really quite different. Women have twice the prevalence of depression than men. Um, they tend to ex experience a higher symptom severity uh, and have a more favorable response to selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, particularly in the premenopausal um, periods of life. Uh, women and men differ in terms of our understanding of, of anatomy of the brain and differences in neuroplasticity with differences in terms of hippocampus, differences in terms of, of neurogenesis um, in the hippocampus and abnormal um, prefrontal limbic um, uh, so, sort of connections that are different from what we see in men. There also are differences in terms of the um, transcriptional signature in the brain of, for women and men, and also differences in the immune signature associated with um, depression in women and men. So what we see again is that there is a true sex difference when it comes to depressive disorder. We wanted to focus briefly and have for a number of years in terms of our own work on omega-3 fatty acids. Um, Western diets tend to be very high in, in um, N6, omega-6 PUFAs, um, corn, corn oil, peanut oil, um, red meats, and others. Um, and that increase in, in um, omega-6 is associated with an increased rate of depressive disorder, as well as an increased rate of a variety of inflammatory conditions. Um, well, N3 fatty acids um, tend to be associated with uh, the resolution of inflammation and a decreased problem with depression and other uh, inflammatory disorders. One of our first subjects looked at um, uh, whether or not um, omega-3 fatty acids could be used as a monotherapy um, in garden variety depression. We had 155 completers of this study who had major depression and, and had a baseline Hamilton depression score of greater than 15. We also had a variety of, of biomarkers that we looked at, in particular, um, the IL-1-RA, IL-6, HSCRP, and then uh, some adip we looked at um, adipokines. We looked at leptin and adiponectin in particular. And we'd hypothesized that individuals with increased inflammation would be those that responded to um, omega-3 fatty acid treatment, and in particular treatment with um, EPA. One of the key things to realize when you look at biomarkers like this is that um, although for HSCRP, we have a very clear definition because of the CDC and, and American Heart Association work of what inflammation is, which is greater than or equal to three on measures of HSCRP. But for 
um, other types of measures like IL-6 or IL-1RA, um, there are no accepted standard measures. And what one really needs to look at is one's data, which tends to be non-normally distributed. And it really suggests that um, one has to be careful about what one is considering to be abnormal and inflamed because the majority of individuals have either very low levels or no measurable levels of these cytokines and cytokine receptors or antagonists. If we look at leptin and adiponectin, what you see again is that there are clear sex differences. And one has to take that into account when one looks at data in, in this area. Unfortunately, frequently, um, people do not take into account the sex differences in leptin and adiponectin levels. If we looked at the correlations that existed for women looking at BMI, HSCRP, IL-6, IL-1 receptor antagonist, leptin, adiponectin, what you see are very strong correlations amongst um, these various um, adipokines, cytokine, cytokine receptors, HSCRP and, and BMI. The ones in yellow are all 0.5 or greater. And, and as you see, there are a lot in yellow. And what you also see on this page is that all of them are statistically significantly correlated. In contradistinction, if you look at the men in this study, you see a very, very different picture with far fewer correlations of 0.5 or greater associated amongst these measures. And in many cases, what you see are um, really a lot of correlations that are, are very, very weak, if present at all, and certainly not statistically significant. So men and women are different when it comes to these measures. If we look at the results from the study, what we see when we separate out men and women is that women are much more likely to, to have four to five um, of these biomarkers of inflammation versus the men. And in general, uh, women, particularly obese women, have very, very high levels of these biomarkers, um, much higher than men. And what we see when we looked at treatment response was that individuals with four to five um, um, biomarkers of inflammation that were high had a much more robust response to EPA than did, they did to DHA or placebo. And the vast preponderance of those individuals were women. This led to the first UG3 grant that was ever given by anyone within any of the institutes within the NIH. It was given by NCCIH to Emory and Mass General. I was at Emory at the time, the PI. And it was a forearm study of placebo, one gram of EPA, two grams of EPA, or four grams of EPA for 12 weeks. And what we saw when we looked at our baseline variables again was that men and women differed. In our sample, women had much higher levels of HSCRP than men. What we also saw when we looked at baseline values, um, when you look at mitogen stimulated values, what one sees is that um, women had a blunted mitogen stimulated response. When we looked at um, IL-6, when we looked at um, TNF-alpha, and we looked at gene expression of TNF-alpha, had a much more blunted response to these mitogens than men. This is suggestive that their um, immune system, and, and if you look at the um, plasma levels, you can see it, though they don't reach statistical significance, but come close, that women are intrinsically more activated in terms of these markers than men, and therefore have a decreased um, uh, mitogen-stimulated response, is what, what you expect to see. Our group and our interest in omega-3 fatty acids is based on the fact that omega-3 fatty acids are the backbone of um, the resolution of inflammation. They're the backbone of the production of resolvins and morancerins and, um, and, posi and positive resolving lipoxins. Um, 
and so we did a study where we contrasted, as I said, those different doses of omega-3. And what we saw um, when we looked at um, uh, these groups is that um, these pro-resolving uh, mediators, 11 HEPE, 12 HEPE, 15 HEPE, um, were all um, correlated with a decrease in HSCRP, and that this effect was driven by the women in the sample versus the men in the sample. Uh, when we looked at, at plasma TNF-alpha, and we looked at, at the presence of resolve in E3, we saw again that this positive effect in terms of uh, decreases in plasma TNF-alpha were associated with um, an increase in women of resolve in E3. One of those um, substances we talked about earlier that were associated with the resolution of inflammatory states. If we look at the correlations amongst the um, specific um, uh, pro-resolving mediators, um, markers of inflammation, um, what we see are different patterns again, with there being much tighter correlations between these measures in women than there are in men. And what one sees in men with the, these shades of blue is areas where there's less strong correlations than we see with the women. Um, in our study that we just talked about, looking at the four different doses of uh, a placebo and three doses of omega-3, what we were able to demonstrate was that the high dose of omega-3, four grams a day of EPA, was associated with a sig statistically significant decrease in levels of HSCRP and were associated with a statistically diff um, significant e increase in an SPM 18 HEPE um, and what one saw with the responders was that level of HEPE was um, at a level of, of 2,113 versus 466 in the non-responders. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time today, so I, I had to summarize these findings for you. But what we see is similar to our, our previous study baseline levels of HSCRP, plasma cytokines, and such varied by sex with women being different than men and women having significantly higher levels of HSCRP. We also showed that um, the sex differences in association between BMI and inflammatory cytokines and also um, uh, SPMs were different for women um, than men. Uh, when we looked at our four gram a day um, sample in the study, the effect was primarily driven by women who had a 75% response rate versus a 25 response rate for men, i.e. Um, a sustained response at, at weeks eight and 12 of um, greater than 50% reduction in um, the depression measures. What we also saw, and unfortunately we don't have time to go into the, the information in detail, was that um, increased response in women was associated with a significantly greater um, increase in level of EPA, despite the fact they're all getting four grams a day. Um, it, they were also associated with a statistically significant decrease in plasma HSCRP in women versus men, and a, a significantly greater increase in um, the, the specific um, pro-resolving mediator 18-HEPE uh, for women uh, as compared to men. So in summary, what we've seen with our data is that there's a subset of women with major depressive disorder who are more likely to have elevated biomarkers of inflammation than men. Um, this suggests that there may be sex differences in response to high-dose omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and that 
Um, these are really intriguing preliminary findings and what we need to do are much larger confirmatory um, studies. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention today. I apologize that I'm not able to be with you in person, but I hope what you've been able to discern is that um, one of our lines of research and one of the things that we're very interested in are these um, differences between men and women, both in terms of major depressive disorder, but also in terms of inflammatory depression. Um, thank you again. Bye now. Well, thank you, Dr. Rappaport. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, uh, and I know all of us are gonna be paying attention to our mega-3 intake, uh, especially important for women. Our second speaker in the mental health section, um, I'm very excited about is Lauren Gim Gimble. She graduated from the University of Utah ob residency and program last year. Uh, and this year sh she's a Utah star scholar and completing a research fellowship that focuses in on perinatal mental health, a really important topic. Um, she's collaborating with psychiatry and behavioral health team with the goal of building a perinatal mental health program. And as you know, this is a major challenge in women's health. And she's going to be taking us through perinatal mental health. Uh, Dr. Gimbel, thank you so much for being here. And she will be here for live Q&A. So get those questions in and we'll be asking them as uh, we go into the live session. Thank you for that futuristic introduction. I'm honored to be here today to talk to you about perinatal mental health. My non-ACGME research fellowship over this past year has really only been made possible through the Utah STAR program as well as through the support of our OBGYN department, specifically by our chair, Dr. Silver, in the OGRN in supporting the research capabilities. Dr. Emily Miller made an excellent grand rounds in the fall that I encourage you to watch if you have not already seen, that focuses more on the treatment of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. A little bit of self-promotion, we're also gonna do a pregnancy echo in June that focuses just on pharmacologic agents and how to choose between them. But today what I wanna do is I wanna spend the next 14 minutes really talking to you guys about what I've learned over the last year in building a framework for thinking about perinatal mental health, as well as starting to get you excited about it. I have no disclosures. Here are my objectives. But I really want to focus on three main goals, and that's to stay calm, euthymia, and that any decision that you make with the patient is the best decision at that time. So starting with staying calm, we know that perinatal depression occurs in about 10 to 15% of women, and perinatal anxiety in up to 20%. We once thought that pregnancy was a protective time period, but we now know this not to be true. This ends up being around a half million cases per year in the US, making it one of the most common under-recognized complications of the perinatal period. The definition that I've liked the most over the last year is perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, which are mood and anxiety disorders during pregnancy or the postpartum period. And perinatal depression or perinatal anxiety is really one of the only psychiatric conditions that's defined by the time of symptom onset, which would be childbirth. The postpartum period that people consider as classified in this category is anywhere from four weeks postpartum up to a year postpartum. In my clinical practice, I consider up to a year postpartum to still be a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. And that's a lot also because of how we've changed our thinking of making sure that we're continuing to take care of women during that year postpartum. So how good are we at screening and treating as OBGYNs, midwives, primary care providers taking care of pregnant and postpartum patients? And it really varies. We have about 50 to 98% of providers do screening for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. 
And in surveys that have looked at OBGYN attitudes and beliefs, the majority of providers feel that treatment is important, that screenings are a responsibility, but they don't feel confident in treating perinatal mood and anxiety disorders or really in their ability to screen or diagnose. One of those surveys had the statement, I feel I've had the appropriate training to treat depression, and only around 30% of providers agree with this. Those that had better training were more likely to screen for perinatal mental health disorders. And this is where I want you to stay calm, that we really haven't been equipped with the capability to be able to do this. And that's gonna be one of our goals, is to give you that training to allow you to feel confident in your ability to treat these women, because I know it's something that we're gonna be able to do. So Austin Powers referenced this is Dr. Evil, and he's always talking about one million or one billion dollars. Similarly, when we're thinking about barriers, there's about one million barriers to screening, diagnosis, and treatment of perinatal patients for mental health. But if we think back to the reason that we're all here to start with, which is taking care of patients, if we ask them what they want, they actually want to talk about mental health during the perinatal and postpartum period with their provider. So historically, I had mentioned that there was a pressure for this to be a positive experience that was protective from mental health disorders, but we know this isn't true anymore. And so women actually want trust, they want to avoid judgment, and they want to be able to talk about their mood with their provider in a way that's not going to make them concerned that they're going to be viewed as no longer fit to be a parent. So not only are they receptive to mental health advice during this time period, but they actually want to talk about it. So ACOG's formal recommendation for screening is to screen for depression and anxiety at least once during the perinatal period. And if this was before postpartum, then to also screen in the postpartum period. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends screening at one, two, four, and six months of their well child visit. What I do in my practice is screen at the new OB visit in the third trimester and in the postpartum period. In terms of types of screening that you can use, it doesn't matter. As long as you screen, that's the most important aspect of it. The next thing I want you to take away from this talk is really to focus on euthymia with the patient. This is used a little bit more with bipolar patients, but I also talk to patients who have depression or anxiety about this as well. We know that pregnancy is a time period of expecting the unexpected, and I wanna make sure that women have tools so that during these time periods that something occurs, that they're able to maintain a stable mood whether that's through mindfulness, through coping mechanisms, or through medications, that those ups and downs of pregnancy, they're really able to maintain a stable mood. And when thinking about euthymia, let's think about when these disorders present. Dr. Wisner et al. in 2013 prospectively studied 10,000 women that they screened for depression with the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale at four to six weeks postpartum. And about 15% of these women screened positive. They then had these women come in for a formal diagnostic interview and they asked a few different questions. One of these was when do symptoms start presenting? What is the time period of symptom onset? And they found that about 40% of women, this occurred in the postpartum period. And this is something I think that we know. That in the postpartum period, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are, are more common than at other times. But it's also important to remember from this data that that also means that 60% of women had symptom onsets before pregnancy or during pregnancy, which are also really great time periods to talk to women about their mental health, especially when they don't have that additional stressor of just having gone through um, a delivery and having a, a newborn at home. The other thing that they asked is, what are the diagnoses of women who screen positive for depression on the EPDS? And they found that the most common diagnoses was depression, which I think we could expect at 69%, but that around 20% of these women had a diagnosis of bipolar depression or bipolar disorder. The remainder of women had anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, 
other disorders or no diagnosis. They also looked at comorbid diagnoses and the majority of women had a comorbid diagnosis. About two thirds of women with depression had it. And that was most commonly over 80% of the time, the comorbid disorder was anxiety. So when we're seeing these patients in clinic, what do these patients look like? They present pretty similarly to outside of the pregnancy or postpartum period, similar to how a major depressive episode would present with low interest, depressed mood, insomnia, fatigue, suicidal ideation. In the postpartum period, they can have a little bit more of irritability, agitation, anger, or hypervigilance. We know that anxiety is often prominent. They can have comorbid disorders, as in Dr. Wisner's study, of up to 66%. And then we also know that somatic symptoms of pregnancy and postpartum often overlap with mood disorders, which is important to think about. So back to thinking about euthymia, an important aspect of treatment is making the diagnosis. So I would encourage you to commit to a diagnosis. I put up a mnemonic that I had learned in medical school but you could use whatever mnemonic you um, had learned in your training of SIGI CAPS, which is sleep, interest, guilt, energy, um, concentration, appetite, psychomotor retardation or agitation or suicide, with having to have five of these symptoms, which the high five is to remember that you have five of these symptoms, with one of them being um, a depression or loss of interest for over two weeks to make a formal diagnosis of depression. And remember Dr. Wisner's study where about 20% of women had bipolar disorder who were screaming high on the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. It's important in these women to rule out bipolar, psychosis, and suicidal ideations to really make sure that you feel like they're safe and to start thinking about any comorbid conditions that they might be presenting with, like anxiety. The idea of euthymia is also important when we're talking about women who already have a diagnosis of depression and are on an antidepressant medication. Dr. Cohen et al. in 2006, who's really one of the pioneers of perinatal mental health, he's the head of the program at MGH in Boston. Him and his group looked at women who already have a diagnosis of depression who are on an antidepressant medication. They compared women who continued their medication to women who discontinued their medication and looked at the rate of relapse of the depression. And what they found is that women who maintained their medication were at lower risk of relapse than women who discontinued their medication. So if you look at those red boxes, Women who continued their medications had a rate of relapse during pregnancy of depression at about 25% compared to women who discontinued their medications had a higher rate of relapse during pregnancy at about 67%. This is an important aspect of thinking about the risk factors for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders where a history of mental health disorder is really one of the leading risk factors. Of course, there's others as well that make you wanna start thinking about the disorder. Remember that the majority of women improve who have perinatal mood or anxiety disorders. When they look at women four months to three years postpartum, about 30% of women still meet criteria for depression. And you could make a lot of um, uh, hypotheses about why this occurs. But one of the aspects is to make sure that we continue to take care of these women in that postpartum period. And then also to make sure that we're actually treating to remission. So we're treating to an improvement in their depressive or anxiety symptoms, as well as the length of treatment. Outside of pregnancy, it's recommended that you maintain euthymia on medications, if that's the treatment option that you've chosen, for six to 12 months to decrease that risk of recurrence. The last thing I want you to take away from this presentation is that any decision that you make with the patient is really that best decision that you can make at the time. After you diagnose the patient, talk to them about the diagnosis, talk to them about the treatment options, 
it can be pretty stressful. It's really a risk-risk discussion of those treatment options. And so reminding them that the decision that they make is really the best decision that they can make at the time. These are some of the risks that I talk about when I'm having a risk-risk discussion of untreated illness compared to pharmacologic treatment. Non-pharmacologic treatment is the third option that I talk about. It's just not on this slide. Um, but I think that after you have this risk-risk discussion, it's interesting because you can have two patients who are in the same scenario at the same gestational age or postpartum period, and they can make a completely different decision of what they want to do with their treatment. And I think that this is a really important aspect because it's a good reminder that we're doing a good job with our counseling and we're really empowering women to make the decision at the time that they feel is best and we're respecting their autonomy and values in this. ACOG and the American Psychiatric Association also talk about when you're having this discussion, talking about the severity of their, of their illness at the time when, when discussing treatment options. If you do choose to do pharmacologic treatment, asking what has worked before. If you use a medication that you already know has worked with the patient, it'll decrease the exposure to the untreated illness as well as increase your chance of success, but decrease that exposure to the illness um, and decrease the amount of time that they uh, have an untreated illness. And then also thinking about what their main symptom is and really thinking about what your diagnosis is. Continuing to address with women, either who have chosen to start medications or non-pharmacologic agents or who have chosen not to do anything um, can be really important because we know that things change in pregnancy and so women may change their mind. So readdressing it with them later on to see if they've changed their mind on any of the options that you had previously discussed. And then making sure that you're treating to remission until their symptoms are no longer there. There's three areas that I think we can improve on. One is in our conservative recommendations, talking about lifestyle, prioritizing sleep for mood, getting outside, walking around the block once per day, and then healthy eating and the decisions that you're making. I think we can improve in our ability to use medications to treat women to remission, to treat them for that full time period to decrease the risk of recurrence, and in committing to a diagnosis, which will help us to think about the symptoms that they're presenting with and in choosing a medication. And then also in our models of care, I think we can build tools to increase our primary OBGYN's ability to treat patients and then use higher level referrals for patients who don't improve or for patients who have bipolar disorder or need a higher level of care. These are the resources that I've found very helpful over this last year. I see our role as screening, diagnosing, treating perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, and destigmatizing and advocating for the mental health of our patients. Remember to stay calm, the goal of euthymia, and remind the patient that any decision that you guys are making is the best one at that time. These are my references. And I'm excited to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Gimbel. That was really, really interesting. And you can put your um, uh, questions in the chat or um, if you want to uh, unmute yourself, that's great. Um, Dr. Varner is asking, how does intimate partner violence factor into perinatal mental health diagnosis and treatment? Yeah, that's a really great question, Dr. Varner. Um, it definitely does factor in. You know, I've been surprised since working in the outpatient clinic at how many of my patients have a history of intimate partner violence in my general OBGYN clinic. I would say at least one, you know, I only do a half day once a week, at least one has a history of intimate partner violence. Um, so definitely, you know, affects mood. Um, uh, there's a lot of PTSD. I think PTSD is more common talked about now, um, that there's different uh, 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 
uh, programs and ways of connecting these patients to resources that we didn't have before. Um, in my clinical uh, mental health clinic, a lot of PTSD, but um, um, uh, so it's relationship in that regard. Uh, another question, really good question. What type of schedule or follow-up are you setting up for patients when you're starting on new medication? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, discontinuation rates are high and side effects, you know, are common. So the majority of side effects aside from the sexual um, dysfunction for SSRIs improve after about the first month. Some don't, but most do. So I normally check in with patients at two weeks after starting the amount of medication some of that is to talk about the side effects. And at the first visit, when I start them on the medication, I warn them that they may have some of those side effects, but to remember that they'll improve. And then at the two week check, what I'm also looking for is if they've had any sort of improvement yet, I wouldn't expect them to have, you know, the full improvement that they would have on that dose um, until four to six weeks. But if a patient has said that they're starting to improve, then that makes me feel a lot better. And like, I want to continue the dose. If they're not really having any improvement and they're not having side effects, then I'll actually increase the dose at that two week mark. After that, once, you know, then I kind of start seeing them more at four week intervals. A really important question is what is your approach if a patient says she's thinking of suicide? Yeah, that's a great question. We just had a, uh, a, a crisis in clinic today, so I'm sorry I'm a little bit late to the conference. Um, but yeah, so, you know, assessing their safety. So if someone's having suicidal ideations, if they have a plan or not, and how they feel, if they feel safe or not. And then also if they have access to firearms at home, if they do have a plan, assessing out what that plan is, seeing what their protective factors are, are and then talking over in every clinic visit, even if they're not having suicidal ideations, I actually talk with them about what a plan would be. And I kind of started out by saying, I don't think this is going to happen, but if things worsened and your mood worsened, you know, what would the plan be? Because then it kind of at least gets you um, to normalize it and have that conversation. And uh, I know that the Huntsman Mental Health Institute is open 24 seven for people who do have uh, a suicide ideation. I, since I do a headache clinic, I'm well aware of this and talking to patients with that as well. Uh, another really good question is, do you see empowering non-psychiatric clinicians given our very lack of psychiatrists uh, across the country and even in Utah as a way and, and specifically OB-GYNs and people who see women uh, as a way to overcome the lack of psychiatrist access. Um, Dr. Dude, you read my mind. Yes, definitely. So collaborative care, you know, is one of the only approaches that's actually worked um, in randomized control trials when they've compared it to other alternatives of incorporating um, mental health care into the primary care setting. There's been two randomized controlled trials that have actually been done with pregnant and postpartum women um, in their clinics, and they found uh, higher rates of uh, improvement as well as length of improvement for women as compared to more traditional or standard care. So you kind of have everyone functioning to their highest level, and that way you're kind of opening up those slots for the psychiatrist to see the higher risk patients or the patients who aren't improving or the patients with bipolar disorder or, or personality disorders. That's, that's really important. I think uh, all of us who see women need to be aware of that. Um, I would like to know, um, how do you screen for the bipolar disorder uh, in, in women? Because sometimes that can be really tricky. Yeah. So I've, I've recently discovered that through Epic, you can assign patient questionnaires before the visit, which is amazing. So I actually assign their, um, all of their uh, screening questionnaires before the visit. And the one I use for bipolar is M called MDQ. It's not um, as good as like the EPDS or the PHQ-9, but it kind of helps me with assessing before I even see them what I'm thinking their risk of bipolar disorder is. 
And then during the visit, the questions that I think are the most helpful is, if you don't get sleep, do you feel energized? And a lot of times patients will say, yeah, I have a burst of energy, but then I feel really tired. Excellent. Any, any other questions uh, before we send, uh, do the next session on equity inclusion that'll be introduced by Dr. Sarah Simonson? Well, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, I'm Dr. Glad. Gimbel. You were awesome. So glad that this was included. So thank you. Yeah, Dr. Simonson, I'm going to send it over to you for our next session. Okay, thank you. The, those first two were really interesting presentations. And now I have the privilege of introducing um, our equity inclu and inclusion section of the presentation. So I'd like to start out by first introducing Dr. Andrea Wallace. So Dr. Wallace is the Associate Dean for Research at the University of Utah College of Nursing. And she aims to move health services forward from simply describing the impact of social determinants of health toward developing means of using social determinants to improve the quality of healthcare services and patient health outcomes. She has multiple um, AHRQ and NIH funded projects with hospitalized COVID tested and emergency department patients. And Dr. Wallace and her team of collaborators focus on implementing patient-centered strategies for assessing social resources during healthcare visits, empowering health teams to incorporate patient social resources in their decision-making processes, and connecting patients with social resource needs to services in their home communities. So welcome, um, Dr. Wallace, and we'll listen to her presentation. Thanks for listening to my talk today, Social Determinants, Risks, and Needs, Implications for Promoting Health Equity and Inclusion. I wanna to start today's conversation by exploring how we get to know the people for whom we are caring. I recall in nursing school hearing repeatedly that we see only a glimpse of our patients' real lives, and only that is when they are not themselves. So here's some pictures and facts about me. But what do you really know about how well I could manage a serious illness? What support would I have? What's, what financial resources? What does the rest of my life context look like? And how could that support my health? And so who are they? These are pictures of patients I had when working as a clinician and researcher focused on diabetes care. In these early observations, I noticed that despite knowing many of my patients had limited literacy skills that placed them at risk of poor outcomes, many did quite well managing complex conditions. But overall, I knew that limited health literacy placed people at risk for poor outcomes. My clinical hunch was that this often had to do with who else was involved in their care and the other social circumstances of their daily lives. So my research has been grounded in these three questions. How do social resources affect diabetes or disease self-management and contribute to health disparities? How can health systems feasibly and effectively respond to social circumstances? And how do we best educate clinicians to respond to social circumstances? But we often face challenges in doing this work because instruments assessing social support often could not be completed by those with limited literacy and did not ask questions that gave us usable information about patients' lives. I didn't feel like we got to, to really what mattered that I could use to guide people's care. So in routine clinical care, we're often left with the lowest common denominator of social context assessment. We do not know what to do with the assessments once we have them, and we go without a firm understanding of how to best intervene. So why do we care? Hint, it all starts with health disparities. Here is a visual of why we need to care. Salt Lake City downtown life expectancy is 75 years where the population is more heterogeneous compared to the more affluent Avenues neighborhood, just right up the road where it's nearly 86 years. This is a dramatic example of health disparities in our community. And we now have important clues about the sources of these health disparities. There are, more, there are many graphics that show different percentages, but there is overwhelming evidence that social conditions, circumstances, environment, and I would argue behavior and medical care is part of those social circumstances as well, is all responsible for the majority of health outcomes. Now, of course, biology and genetics are important, 
but the vast majority of health outcomes and thus disparities in those health outcomes are byproducts of social factors. And here's a visual from the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities that shows how they break down the complex factors we now know contribute to health disparities for different populations. Here it clearly shows the complexity of what are primarily social factors at play. So why we care is that here is to achieve health equity, we need to address health disparities. So then what do we do about all this? Hint, we organize our thinking with the use of some key terms. And the first term is social determinants of health. Social determinants of health or SDOH are the conditions and the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. A critically important thing to remember about social determinants is that they can both positively and negatively affect health outcomes. And this is a key thing to remember moving forward when you hear conversations about social determinants of health, because it's often misused as a term. Term two, social risk factors. Social risk factors are the specific adverse social conditions that are associated with poor health, like social isolation or housing instability. There are, these are factors that negatively affect health outcomes. And term three, social needs. The need for an individual as a result of social determinants of health for things like food, housing, medicines, help with self-care. They are the specific tangible needs that if unaddressed negatively affect health outcomes that are most often assessed in healthcare settings. So let's take stock with an imperfect visual for linking SDOH risks and needs. So again, social determinants is a very broad term that usually aligns with systems level interventions. I say usually, not always, but usually. Most of the research in this area is ideologic and the implication is more about public policy. Think anti-discrimination legislation. Social risks get a little more concrete and actionable, perhaps variable high school gradua graduation rates in a community that then can get to the individual level with a variable called education. And at the individual level is where we, again, generally speaking, move more toward interventions such as social work outreach or screening. But this is really hard work when undertaking interventions to address social determinants or needs. So we are gradually building models that may help understand how social determinants of health data can be used across the clinical spectrum. Here's one example of many, but it's a useful example of how to help frame some example, or <laughs> excuse me, frame our thinking. In this, you can see it aligns well with the yellow one I gave two slides ago. But here on the left, we start at the individual or more reductionist level and move to the societal level and the more expansionist level on the right. So starting on the left at the individual level, we use risk assessment and clinical decisions. The idea is to screen for things like social needs, food, housing, and security, things like that, and connect with resources. Here are examples of two commonly used screening tools, the CMS Accountable Health Communities Tool and the Prepare. We also use yet another in our work at UHealth called the Sincere Screener. And this slide, and granted these are from 2019, but it shows we have a long way to go to even screen for social needs, much less address them in our clinical settings. The second strategy in that framework that I just offered is um, performance assessment. Here's an example from a 2019 HSR paper that, that talks about this, adjusting for social risk factors impacting impact performance and penalties in the hospital readmissions reductionist program. And really what this tells us in a nutshell is that risk adjustment and performance assessment is a way to account for the fact that certain places by the nature of what they do and where they are, treat patient populations with more risks and needs. That complicates system improvement or the processes in the middle. And that needs to be understood as a central focus and accounted for when trying to address social determinants. We, we really need to understand how certain healthcare systems, um, I wouldn't say disadvantage because that's the wrong word, but it's, it, um, it's difficult to move the needle in terms of outcomes and we need to understand how different populations um, affect our, our healthcare system.
And here, person, person focused interventions. Here's an RCT looking at the impact of a CHW um, uh, being placed in the care on a post discharge outcomes in a targeted patient population in Philadelphia, where community health workers, social workers, and case managers offered comprehensive care. And this is a very common um, model of addressing person focused interventions. But something to note here in these person centered interventions should, that they need to use person centered metrics for evaluation. And this is a key emphasis in this research being done now. How do we get to a good outcome measure in interventions that actually are trying to address social needs? Is it readmission? Is it reduced costs? Or is it something else like engagement, um, the quality of communication and activation for patients with social needs? So this is a key question being tackled right now. And the final interventions in that model is that will impact, they impact a whole population. A recent high profile example you may recall is how the elevated blood lead levels in children in the community of Flint led to policy changes at the local and state level. This is another example would be looking at access to care in rural populations, for instance, and public health measures to, to address that. So now I'm gonna take a break and I wanna briefly talk about lessons we've learned from our own research at UHealth. Our interventions focus on social needs screening. We developed a social needs screener for food, housing, transportation, things like that. Patients are screened in the ED and then United Way's 211 service contacts patients within 48 hours of discharge to get community service referrals. And we know that patients receive an average of five service referrals for 46 unique community resource providers, community clinics, prescription drug discounts, charities covering cost of medical tests, housing, food, utilities, children's charities, and transportation services. And then we try to learn from all this, from our screening data, from the 2-on-1 outreach data, and then we pull data from Epic's Enterprise Data Warehouse. And we've documented a lot of need in our UHealth ED. Between 40 and 60% of ED patients screened indicate needs, and 60% of whom wish referral to 211. And I say that range between 40 and 60%. It just it depends on the population and, and the time of screening. And what we've learned, we have few to no technical barriers for staff, 211, or the patients in doing this. We do this for a very simple technology. But staff and patient qualitative work identify screening and referral barriers rooted in stigma, privacy concerns, and a desire for sincere connections. And an important implication of screening for in terms of equity is that unless we find ways of doing this better, we won't reach the majority of patients who have needs and, and realize population health benefit from addressing social determinants of health. So we continue. Right now, we are conducting a four-year study to examine whether community service use improves health outcomes and whether thoughtful connections and collaborative goal setting overcomes barriers to community service use. So this is all to be continued where we're really trying to improve the outreach of our intervention. And our second study about social needs that's going on at UHealth is in the inpatient setting as part of a hospital discharge process. And in this study, patient social needs and supportive resources are assessed and communicated through EPIC displays as part of discharge planning. We are examining service and unit level changes in patient readiness for hospital discharge, post-discharge coping and readmissions. A particular focus of this work is on the clinical team itself on how well they communicate patient reported outcomes um, and how they, they communicate um, patient social information. So far, what we've learned is that discharge team members' understanding of social needs is associated with patient-reported outcomes. Social needs assessments contribute to decisions made about discharge with home health or to skilled nursing, even when controlling for demographic, demographics, insurance, and acuity. And social support is perhaps the most important social need to assess. And overall, there's a critical need to make social information transparent during hospital discharge and transitions to follow-up care. A patient is more than their discharge summary. As we know, how do we know about these people and what their circumstances are? So wrapping up, we have some takeaways here. Screening for social determinants during clinical encounters remains controversial. 
And there's debate about whose job it is, whether it distracts from other medical care, and clinicians do not feel very confident in their capacity to address social risks or needs. But patients know it's important. They know our limitations to address all their needs, and they want it to be done well, not just a list of things that you're checking off in your daily encounter. And finally, patients want screening to be accompanied with concern, care, and sincerity. There are, more important there are important implications for inclusion here, as social inclusion is marked by all groups of people feeling included and valued within their society or community. So if we want to ground work in social determinants, we need to ground our work efforts in these tenets if we want to address health equity and address inclusion. We want to include patient-centered metrics. We want to conduct universal screening to limit bias so we're not selecting people based off of appearance or other uh, demographic characteristics. We want to consider health communication needs, literacy, language, culture. We want to ensure privacy when exchanging data, link to service providers with clear referral processes, and we want to address patient receptivities and barriers. Thank you for listening to this work, and I hope this gives you some good ideas about how to address health equity and foster inclusion uh, in, during, uh, in social determinants of health. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Wallace. We have, it looks like, some questions in the chat. First of all, is there a tool that clinicians in the clinic can use to assess social determinants within our clinics at, at the U? Well, way to open up the, the big question in the room, Dr. Degree. So first of all, thank you for having me here today, y'all. Um, there, there are any number of tools. There are questions that are in Epic right now, um, but there seems to be, um, there's benefits and drawbacks in, for each of them. Um, we do have our sincere screening tool that we use in the ED. It's a, it's a 10 item um, tool that was developed so that it could be patient self-administered and we do have psychometrics on it now um, available. So happy to share that to anyone who's interested in integrating it into their practice. But, but this is the big question about, again, who does it? Where does it go? How's it used as part of clinical practice? So happy to talk with anyone who um, is interested in the tool and looking at it and, and seeing if it would be useful. You looked at whether there's any gender differences in, in social determinants? No, you know, we haven't. Um, we, I'm trying to think of one of the analyses that we're running now. Um, we haven't. Now, we are seeing language differences. Um, we've recently added a second site to, to get um, more Spanish speakers and to understand what their unique needs are. Interestingly enough, in that population, um, language is um, really coming up as a, as a key factor. And um, interestingly enough, um, if Spanish speakers um, seem to say that they have needs, they're more likely to accept outreach, which is fantastic for our studies purposes. But we haven't seen as far as I know, I'm trying to think, I don't think that there's been any gender differences. Um, as with a lot of these um, screeners though, I believe we do have more women on average complete them. So, um, but I'm sorry, I should have come prepared for that question with this crowd. <laughs> the gender, gender yeah. answer, yeah. yeah I but I, I don't, I, nothing that is bubbled up, no. Okay. Um, another question, with more patient complexity and shrinking visit times, is this best addressed by clinicians or other ancillary and support staff-led mechanisms? How could we have it be reimbursed? Wow, two big questions. So yeah, those are two big questions. I'll start with the reimbursement one. Um, there are ways through CMS, through Z codes that um, are being explored. And also I think it's the, the CC code. So I don't know a ton about that, but there are people looking into that. So um, how, is that a good way of deflecting that one? Um, and then the, the first question, oh, well, yeah. And, and I think that that's a key question about the implementation of this. Um, our patients in the ED really wanted, they would always name nurses as the people they want to have asking these questions. Um, and um, of course, with, 
with the limitations in their time as well. I mean, you're saying is, is every bit as limited as, as the physician's time as well, or the other providers. Um, so we did develop various methods so that the, our screening tool that we use can be patient self-administered um, so that it could be implemented in any number of ways. Um, so right now in the ED, actually it's registration staff who are doing the screening. And then um, it's two on ones community service referral doing the follow up. So I agree that we need to explore ways that we can get this done and, and have it be useful to the to the health team. Um, that said, patients don't want to just be asked these questions and have them go nowhere. So that is um, the challenge to make sure it makes sense and, and part of workflow. Hopefully that answered your question, but but yes, there has to be other ways to, to implement it. Jess Sanders wrote, thank you for the presentation. And with the screener and 211 follow-up, do you know if they have seen an increase in individuals reaching out and actually utilizing the recommended services? Yes. So we are tracking that now. And that's actually the point of our um, current study that's under that's going on right now. Um, we are really working hard on sort of clo it's called a closed loop referral system. It, um, everyone's talking about that in terms of once you refer out, what happens? Do you know if, if it was successful for them? And 211s tracks that type of outreach. But we're really trying to engage patients um, longer term. So with the 211 outreach specialist, um, instead of just saying, here's five referrals, good luck, we'll check in with you in a couple of weeks. Um, we're really trying to engage with patients and setting one referral priority at a time and to be able to, to make progress on, on um, what is a priority to the patients. So if they say housing, um, they, they really work on solving that with them over time. Um, so to be continued, but, but that is a, a major, a major point of it. So I have a question about some of your qualitative data where, where providers felt concerned about um, privacy and relationship building. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, so well, it wasn't as much that provide, well, we get some concern from staff in terms of privacy and relationship building because the, um, our ED staff have um, had some pushback from patients. You know, why are you asking me these questions? Because they are, um, you don't want to sort of marginalize already um, challenged or vulnerable patients, right? And, and they're not used to necessarily being asked these questions as part of their healthcare encounters. Um, but patients in a focus group, interestingly enough, really are, they understand why they're being asked. They, they, um, but they, and they don't expect us to address all of it, but it's critically important that they don't feel like it follows them around. That was one of their key um, concerns um, because it, we, we described this as um, in general, everyone there kind of communicated that they would feel like this is a hope this was a temporary circumstance, and they would feel like the providers were judging them and following the, the information follows them that they were having um, some sort of um, struggle. Um, we try to diffuse that a little bit about making clear in our screening questions it's not just about money, um, and that we feel very strongly. And um, we ask about childcare and el uh, elder care barriers and transportation barriers, things like that. But um, it's the, but there are concerns on both both ends of this that that making these conversations, particularly if you can't respond with anything, that it um, it it could undermine relationships. So it has to be approached with sincerity, with um, with a sense of um, really approaching everyone, making clear that everyone is asked these questions. We're not just asking you this because you are uninsured or you have Medicaid or you look like X, Y, or Z. Um, that was really important for the patients that you have to make that clear. So it sounds like similar to perinatal mental health screening, it needs to be normalized that everyone's asked the same questions mm -hmm. routinely. Yeah, and, and similarly, um, making sure that it's clearly communicated why. We're asking this because we have some resources that we may be able to connect you with. And we know this is important for your health and well-being. So, and, um, but we're also finding it's also important to say, this isn't this, this, in our study, at least, it's not going in your medical record. Now that's, that's a, a bit of a rub right now about what happens with that. So to be continued on those conversations. 
So right now it isn't going in the medical record to address that concern of it following them. Yeah, right now it isn't. Right now we, we're using REDCap and um, it's worked pretty well. And, and interestingly enough, it, it was, um, I mean, it was for logistics in terms of our study itself and making connections to 211, but then it's also responsive to the patient's concerns. That said, there are questions in EPIC there that are being used in certain parts of, of U Health, um, And so it's, it's really trying to go back to the patients and find out more about that. But, but this is a, definitely an ongoing area of research where really it should be, live. And, and I think the, big, the big takeaway is if it's not doing something, then putting it in the medical record just to, um, to check boxes isn't what patients want. Uh oh, you're muted. Oh, I'm muted. Such interesting work, and it seems like there's so much more work to do going forward with this. <laughs> yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm here. You all have my email, so you're welcome to, to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. Dr. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to introduce now our next presenter in this session, and this is Dr. Deanna Kepka. Um, Dr. Kepka, PhD, MPH, is a Huntsman Cancer Institute investigator and a tenured associate professor in the College of Nursing at the University of Utah. She's a member of the Cancer Control and Population Sciences Research Group, and she's the Director of Global and International Health in the College of Nursing and the founding director of the 400-plus member 12-state Intermountain West HPV Vaccination Coalition. Dr. Kepka's main research interests are the gaps in healthcare access and quality for vulnerable populations as related to cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. She focuses specifically on preventing cervical cancer and other HPV-related cancers among vulnerable patient populations locally and globally. So let's welcome Dr. Kepka. Hi, my name is Deanna Kepka. I'm an investigator at Huntsman Cancer Institute. I'm also a professor at the College of Nursing at the University of Utah. I work mainly in HPV vaccination. So I'm here to talk about vaccines, the solution, vaccine access and hesitancy, the challenge. So I do have um, one conflict of interest that I'd like to report. I do receive, I'd like to disclose that I receive a small portion of my salary from American Cancer Society, and they receive um, a larger grant from Merck that um, supports that salary. So my main deal is HPV vaccination. And in the U.S., HPV infection is incredibly common. It is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the world and in the United States. One in four of us sexually active adults have HPV right now. 80% of us will have it at some point in our lives. But most of us clear this infection from six months to two years and do not have any long-term effects from it. However, however, those of us who don't may develop um, abnormal pap tests. That's one in five to one in 10 women have an abnormal pap test or a positive HPV test. And among those um, precancers, they may lead to cancer. So if we had adequate HPV vaccination in the United States, we could prevent 34,000 cancers each year. Now, when you think about HPV cancers, what are the most common cancers that you think of? And just think about it in your head. What's the most common HPV cancers that you know of? So you may be thinking that cervical is the most common HPV cancer in the United States. It's actually oral pharyngeal cancer, cancer of the back of the throat. And it is most commonly um, occurs in men, white men. So it's contra contrary to what we typically think about HPV vaccine. We think, oh, it's protecting against cervical cancer in women. That's the main deal. But it's actually also protecting against oral pharyngeal, anal, and penile cancer in men, along with vaginal and vulva cancer, along with anal and oral pharyngeal cancer and cervix in women. And when you think about vaccination, HPV vaccination, if we got it up to where it should be, which is 80% of our kids vaccinated by age 13, we could prevent over 90% of cervical cancers and those other HPV-related cancers. 
And the thing about is we have 11,000 cases of cervical cancer each year in the US, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. The HPV vaccine would prevent 200,000 cases of precancers, which are indicated by um, abnormal pap tests and positive HPV tests and can relate to risk for pregnancy and other socio sociological, psychological, economic, and additional burdens that women and their families face when facing abnormal pap tests and related um, treatment for those precancers. All of this could be prevented by this vaccine. And that's what I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper into HPV vaccination. Well, we've got some challenges in the United, United States around HPV vaccination. And then we went through this two year pandemic going on three years. And with that pandemic, we had the largest drop in vaccination rates among adolescents. Adolescents were the least likely to go in for their well child visits during the pandemic. As a result, in the country, in the United States, we have an 18% drop in HPV vaccinations, along with Tdap and men meningococcal or Minoctra. So we've got to get these kids back in for their primary care visits, and we've got to catch, the, catch them up on HPV vaccination. This is the platform, the adolescent platform. We know starting at age nine is a really effective strategy for bumping up HPV vaccination. And those are American Cancer Society's primary recommendations right now. Start at age nine and 10 for the first dose of HPV. It's long before puberty. Parents are more accepting of the vaccine and then get their second dose when they come in for their well child visit one year later. But if you don't wait, if parents are like, oh, my kid's not ready, they're not sexually active, you know what? The vaccine will not be as beneficial waiting till later age because the immune system is most responsive at that younger age. And furthermore, if you get to age 15, when you start the HPV series, now you need three doses. So you go from a two-dose series to a three-dose series, which is just incredibly burdensome for busy families. Furthermore, if you wait before age 15 and ideally get it before 13, starting at nine, you can get that two dose series 12 months apart. If you don't wait until 15, you need three doses which in, within six months to be compliant. How are we doing in the West in terms of HPV vaccination? Well, we've got a long ways to go. I like to call us the sea of light blue, the sea of white that I have been really addressing for the last 10 years of my career at the University of Utah. We've got a lot of barriers to HPV vaccination in the Mountain West region and specifically in the state of Utah. So if you look at this map of the United States, when people ask me, what's the number one factor that relates to whether or not a child received the HPV vaccine? Let me tell you, the number one factor is where you live. If you live in the Northeast, Rhode Island, 95% of those kids are HPV vaccinated. If you live in the West or Mississippi, South Carolina, um, Virginia, West Virginia, you're much, much less likely. In most of those states, less than half the kids are up to date with HPV vaccination by age 17. And then the patterns of vaccine hesitancy have been pretty similar for the COVID-19 vaccine. You look at similar patterns of lower performing states being in the South and in the West for COVID-19 vaccine. So that's telling me that vaccine hesitancy is a social construct that can um, relate to many, many different um, types of vaccines and for a variety of age groups within the context of what's happening at our society at the time. When we look at how states are doing for one dose, Utah is 46 in the country. That means there's only like a handful of states worse than us for our kids getting the first dose of the HPV vaccine by the time that they're 17. And I know for a fact that if you look at um, completion of this series, Utah is even lower. We're in the, I think we're the 50th or 51st state for completion of the multi-dose series. And then another factor I'd like to bring up is rural urban disparities. So if you look in the green, that's living in a, in an urban area, metropolitan statistical area.
compared to the, um, the turquoise, the turquoise is living in a non-MSA, that's a rural community. And time and time again, we see lower HIV vaccination rates and lower completion rates for children who are living in rural settings across the United States. And this is especially problematic because often we see higher rates of cervical cancer and cervical cancer mortality and other HIV-related cancers in rural settings and in urban settings. And that's often due to access to healthcare and pap testing and follow-up procedures. So why, I got a little bit into, I already got into why this is happening, but some other thoughts are, you know, there's many, many layers of barriers that rural communities face in the Mountain West that it could impact HIV vaccination. Some of them could be cultural views, but other points could be, you know, sometimes parents are driving an hour to two hours to get to a rural healthcare provider or a rural county health department that offers vaccines. So vaccine distribution access can be a challenge. Often electronic health records aren't always syncing with the vaccine registry in rural settings. They haven't um, developed that level of sophistication for vaccine tracking. Missed opportunities for vaccines. Kids are coming in for their Tdap and Minoctra. They're required for school, but they're not being recommended for HPV when they're already there in their office. Provider shortages. We know we have a shortage of primary care providers in rural settings in the United States. And clinical constraints. You may have longer appointment wait times in rural settings because of those provider shortages, and it may be difficult to come back for that second or third dose. We also know that fewer evidence-based HIV vaccination interventions have been tested in rural settings in the United States. So what are some um, fact, like evidence-based strategies or factors related to improving HIV vaccination that we should be exploring and implementing in the Mountain West? Well, when I think about HPV vaccine hesitancy, I can't help but think about this overall vaccine hesitancy model. Where is this hesitancy coming from? Some of it is confidence in our healthcare systems, in our government, in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, guideline-making institutions, trusting in their recommendations. Other factors are complacency. You know, if I get COVID, it's not really that bad for me. You know, people get better. It's like the flu. You know, so that's being complacent, not prioritizing that it's that big of a deal. Um, another issue is convenience. You know, if you have to go for a multi-dose vaccine and you live in a rural setting, that can be very inconvenient. Um, calculating, are, how much information gathering are people doing related to their vaccine choices for themselves and their children? And what is their willingness to protect others? So. Maybe I think, oh, if I get COVID, I'll clear it and it won't be a major problem. But what about my social responsibility for grandparents, for persons who are immunocompromised, for people who are in more vulnerable situations than myself um, in terms of their health? Is What is my collective response in terms of my duty to be protected so I don't spread a virus and affect others? All of these factors influence vaccine decisions. So we know evidence-based strategies that work for HPV vaccination are increasing access, making HPV vaccine more available in a variety of different settings. And maybe that could be expanding HPV vaccine access to more pharmacies or to dental practices or getting in at every school, have vaccine immunization days in schools that really emphasize the importance of this cancer prevention vaccine. Treating every visit as a vaccination visit. So if a kid comes in with a, an ear infection or a sore throat, that's an opportunity to vaccinate. You don't want to let them leave your office. You don't know when you'll see them again. Treat every visit as a vaccination visit. Prompt the healthcare provider with EHR systems, with healthcare teams, reminding providers that every visit that a kid comes in keep them up to date on the vaccines that kid is eligible for and encourage that strong recommendation to get it. We know the number one most effective factor that relates to whether or not a child receives the HPV vaccine is do they get that strong recommendation from their healthcare provider? Whether that key healthcare provider is a nurse, a physician assistant, a physician, is that provider telling them, yes, today you're getting Tdap, HPV, and meningococcal vaccines, let's throw in COVID and flu, they're gonna happen in 10 minutes. That's what's happening. And 
present each of these recommended vaccines the same in the same way and give them on the same day as you would other vaccines. Really emphasizes they're all recommended. They're all important vaccines for your child's health. And then you need to track series completion and follow-up to measure and improve performance. So we did a survey during COVID that looked at vaccine hesitancy among young adults in the Mountain West. We surveyed about 3,000 young adults, mostly women participated, but we have some representation from males and other genders, a variety of ages, but most of them were younger to between 18 to 21. We captured the whole West in our sample, but had an oversample of Utah participants. We also oversampled rural participants, 40% rural. And we really found that our rural participants were more likely to be vaccine hesitant, not thinking that they were necessarily a good way to protect from disease, not necessarily agreeing that they're safe, and not necessarily agreeing that they're safe and as effective as often as urban participants would. And we also saw similar factors when we looked at, um, you know, how important are vaccines to them for protection? We saw our urban participants having a much stronger advocacy for vaccines than ur our urban participants having more um, support for vaccines than our rural participants across every single component in terms of um, believing that they prevent disease, believing that they work, and trusting their provider recommendations. But we looked overall, who do people want to get their recommendations from? The number one indicator across 70% of our survey respondents of that 3,000 sample was they wanna hear from their physician. And 51% wanna hear from their provider and about two thirds wanna hear from um, their author health authorities. Not as many wanna hear from government in terms of vaccination. So this just highlights the points that I was already making that young adults living in rural areas had a 40% less odds of intending to read the, receive the COVID-19 vaccine compared to urban. So we just saw a much higher rate of hesitancy in rural and it also related to HPV. So young adults who had received an HPV vaccine were 1.8 times more likely to intend to receive a COVID vaccine. So we see a similar patterns across both vaccines, pro-HPV, pro-COVID, not pro or get supportive of receiving HPV, not as likely to intend to get the COVID vaccine. Lastly, I just wanna talk about, we have a Mountain West HPV Vaccination Coalition at Huntsman. We work across disciplines. We'd love for you to participate in our coalition, get in touch with me. If you wanna join our activities, we have monthly webinars, in-person meetings soon, now that we're getting post-COVID once a year. And this is my son getting his full adolescent bundle of HPV, um, Tdap, and meningococcal um, last summer during the COVID pandemic. He was a true sport to having a professional photographer there. So I'm really proud of him to be able to not only get this cancer prevention vaccine, but also to demonstrate um, his courage in this huge social media campaign. Feel free to get in touch with me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Kepka. That was an excellent talk. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, and I know that you had responded in the chat, but maybe we can talk about this as a group um, briefly. So there was a question about, are there similar geographic disparities in other childhood vaccines? Is it vaccines in general or certain vaccines? that dare I say, the ones that are more political or tied to beliefs about sex, et cetera. Well, <clears throat> hi, thank you everyone for listening. I'm able to, I feel most comfortable speaking about the adolescent vaccine platform. Um, so that's Tdap, meningococcal, HPV. I could speak a little bit about flu and COVID. And what I could say is, um, we were definitely seeing a lot more vaccine hesitancy around COVID and um, HPV, and we've never had really great flu vaccine rates. But the thing about Tdap is approved um, as a mandate for most um, required, it's a requirement for most schools in the United States and in most states. Meningococcal is a mandate in some states, and Utah has adopted meningococcal as a mandate since I've been here in Utah in the last decade. So 
We've seen the rural urban disparities dissipate as the vaccines become required. So we don't see a rural urban difference for Tdap. We see a slight difference for meningococcal. But I do think COVID um, and HPV and flu, we've got a lot of challenges with them. And I, I think it's, I don't think there's a simple solution in saying exactly what's going on. All I can say is there's cultural beliefs that relate to where you live that are relating to vaccine acceptance around these, these vaccines. Oh, gender differences. Um, yeah, so in um, we do constantly seeing a lag in HP vaccination among boys in the United States and in Utah, um, particularly because people just aren't necessarily informed that HPV oral pharyngeal cancer is the most common HPV cancer, and it most commonly occurs in men. So we have some challenges there too. Um, and Dr. Varner says mRNA vaccine platforms could revolutionize childhood yes. vaccine schedules by combining multiple vaccines so the kids don't have to get poked multiple times. Are HPV vaccines being converted to mRNA platforms? I haven't heard that at the scientific meetings that I've been at yet, but I tend to not be going to the basic science sessions. I go to the health services research and um, health system sessions. So I am not aware of that happening yet, nor with my, I work pretty closely with Merck too. But I, I'm welcome to, Hear what um, hear what's happening in the field and see how that could affect things. I do know there's evidence um, that one dose of the HPV vaccine is effective, and um, the World Health Organization is moving in that direction for girls. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not as strong of a platform as having the multi dose, but it still makes a difference. So when you look at the fact that. Um, you're seeing similarities in the uptake of COVID vaccines and HPV vaccines in these groups. Yeah, I just presented that talk at, actually at the huge European HPV meeting in Germany because it is pretty interesting that we're seeing. That. Yeah, so what's, what's your takeaway? Is that telling you that it's more about general vaccine hesitancy and vaccine beliefs or misinformation? I think we have a lot to learn about what's happening in our society around misinformation and what's happening in our society around who we trust. Um, and I think that's a key problem. I mean, I definitely, I, I know HPV has been complicated in the sense how it was marketed in the beginning. I think they're doing a much better job now as framing it as a cancer prevention vaccine for boys and girls. Um, but yeah, clearly. I mean, clearly there's similar levels of vaccine hesitancy. We saw it like in our multivariate models. So <laughs> yeah. Dr. Frost, a great point about who to trust. And it looked like in your data, people didn't want government authorities. Yeah. That's not where in this sample to. that we have, which is the wild, wild west sample, you know. Yeah. Um, we've got those cultural values here. You have data on HPV hesitancy over time and in association with vaccination requirements as a focus of political discourse. That's an interesting question. Yeah, so we definitely saw a correlation with political identification in our survey, and we are able to survey the sample again. Many of them agreed to be resampled. So we will, and we saw changes in intent over time in terms of when the vaccination was approved. Um, so it seemed like a lot of rural participants were supportive of the idea of a COVID vaccine, but then once it was actually approved and rolled out, they were less supportive of it. And it was also at the same time that we had a major political change in our, in our president, right? It was the exact same time that that happened. So we saw a lot less enthusiasm um, when the vaccine was actually approved a year ago by po political affiliation. So. I think it's complicated. I think we're gonna keep looking at this and we're gonna try and work on different interventions that build trust and build confidence in science because literally people are dying because of this. I mean, we know a million deaths of COVID just were announced today, a million deaths. 
And the saddest thing is many of those people had the opportunity to receive the COVID vaccine. This is costing people's lives. And we have 33,000 deaths due, I mean, 33,000 cancer cases due to HPV each year in the US. It's costing people's lives. So anyone who wants to work on vaccine hesitancy, I'm always looking for partners. I don't have a lot of scientific partners here at the U. So I'm always looking for new ones. So. And it sounds like there's plenty of work still to be done. Oh, this. yes. I mean, we our vaccination rate in Utah in, um, for HPV was state number 51 for up to date. We had less than half of our kids by age 17 getting protected against HPV-related cancers. And I expect the numbers to be worse this year. Well, thank you for such an interesting talk and a discussion. Um, both Dr. Wallace and Dr. Kepko, we're so grateful to you for your time and sharing Thank your you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, we, now, <laughs> we now have time built in for a break for poster viewing. Um, so we will uh, pause until 1.50. So that's a 12 minute break. And can someone um, paste the link into the, or let's see if I can paste the link into the chat for the posters. There we go. So there's the link for the posters and we'll return back at 1.50 p.m. Thank you. So um, I'm Karen Frost, and um, we are going to have two presentations. Next presentations are going to be about um, the impact of uh, COVID-19. Uh, I just love all these topics that we're hearing about. They're so timely. This is fantastic. So um, the first group that's going to present is myself, Scott Benson, who's here with us, and then Lisa Grin. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about our team. Um, Lisa Grin is an associate professor in the Division of Public Health here at the University of Utah. She uses a mixed methods framework. Uh, for her research on health equity, which focuses on connecting diverse communities with health and social services, including developing interventions that are appropriate for low resource settings. Dr. Gren co-leads the outreach, outreach core of the Utah Center for Promotion of Work Equity Research, which is called UPower. Um, and it has an emphasis on bringing workers into conversations about improving their own health. In addition, she is the director of the Center for Research on Migration and Refugee Integration, and um, she works with providing opportunities for students to be involved in health equity research and implementation projects. And Dr. Grin is actually going to be the person who um, talks through our slides. She's not able to join us today, but she did the um, presentation itself. And then our uh, another team member is um, Dr. Scott Benson. He's an infest, infectious disease physician. He's an associate professor in the Division of Public Health at the University of Utah. He's also the former director of the International Travel Clinic and has led global health programs around the world. Currently, Dr. Benson is wrapping up his work on a Gates Foundation project in Pakistan regarding multi-drug resistant salmonella typhi in water, wastewater, and biofilms in distribution systems. His work in Pakistan includes an emphasis on balancing gender among the engineering faculty and students. He continues to lead learning abroad programs in Ghana and Peru. And I know he's getting these off the ground for the summer. So we're all happy to get back to doing that. And uh, recently, Dr. Benson focused, um, has focused on research challenges, challenge populations locally as part of global health, including refugee and immigrant populations in Utah. And then I'm the third member of the team and my name is Karen Frost. And I am a research professor in the College of Social Work, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Research Integrity and Compliance for the University. Um, my research is about research integrity, and I serve as the research integrity officer, so, officer, so lots of research integrity things going on there. Um, I'm a qualitative researcher, um, and I emphasize um, um, ethnography and phenomenology. And um, I also work on mixed method frameworks, which um, allows me to work really well with Dr. Grant and Dr. Benson on these things. Um, and I work collaboratively with students, colleagues, and community partners to address research that is applied and uh, works on real world problems for underserved groups, as well as for women across the lifespan. So our talk is gonna go ahead and be first. And then after that, we have Dr. Valerie Flattis from the College of Nursing, and I will introduce her 
uh, introduce her just before her talk. So I think we'll go ahead and um, put up our talk and uh, we'll go for it. Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Lisa Grant and I'm happy to present on behalf of Drs. Frost and Benson on some work that we've been doing related to staff impacts from the COVID pandemic. Um, the framework for, the, for what we did was the seven domains of health, which specifies that we can think about health in these different domains and that there are overlapping influences. Um, and for this particular study, we wanted to think about physical and emotional or mental health, as well as perhaps identifying some financial impacts um, to staff members. We started with some background <clears throat> looking at the impacts um, predominantly to faculty um, and found that uh, what was being reported from work done early on in the pandemic was that uh, faculty members felt they had overall less time available. Um, and in particular, this was found among those who had young dependents. Um, women also had overall sort of a 5% greater decline than men did. And that these two were additive, that is um, being a woman and having young dependents was a greater impact than um, just one of those. And um, the second uh, piece of work that was published was um, some focus groups that showed that both caring for children or caring for older adults had impacts on clinical faculty and that this raised the concern that there was um, worry about people's promotion timelines, um, concerns that there was less mentoring available to them and that that would be Another study that was done looked at students um, and showed that most uh, staff and students perceived adverse impacts. Um, one of the things they looked at was increased workload and, and both students and staff reported increased workload early on in the pandemic, um, but that uh, staff were more likely to report a higher workload than students. And that there were some social and um, emotional impacts. So people were concerned about not having interaction with their peers. Um, they reported having lack of motivation and then uh, loneliness, anxiety, those kinds of comments also. This study, or excuse me, this report in the New York Times that looked at remote work and how we were going to think about coming back to work or whether remote or hybrid work would continue. And the findings were that um, established employees were in favor of continuing remote work as were women and people of color. However, there's a challenge referred to as the proximity bias, which is that if people aren't visible in some way to decision makers, they may not be able to participate in uh, decisions that will impact their future of work. So this is in particular difficult for people who already feel underrepresented. Uh, and we refer here to women and people of color who often feel underrepresented in the workplace or um, underrepresented in terms of being able to make decisions. And so this can lead to sort of a vicious cycle where you may prefer the remote work because it works for your personal life work balance, um, but that may make you even less able to um, be seen by supervisors. And in this article, they talk about some best practices which refer to making expectations clear in terms of written handbooks or guidelines, providing mentoring, and creating opportunities for what they refer to as virtual water coolers so that people can interact together. That led us to our study, um, which is a mixed method study. Uh, the survey portion is looking at what are the impacts perceived by staff. We wanted to focus on staff because there's less written in the literature about them. And um, then we also wanted to explore in focus groups what people thought about policy, policy that was working or not working, things they'd heard about that they'd like explored, that kind of thing. 
And so that work will happen in the summer uh, of this year. Finally, that will culminate in a case study that we should have finished up in fall of this year. I wanna talk here about the survey because that's where we have data collected so far. So in April of 2022, we sent um, a survey link to a Qualtrics survey. This is an IRB approved 33 item survey. And the um, advertising about this link went out through staff council communications, Pulse communications and college deans who could access listservs and send to their staff. I'm going to report on uh, responses that we've received through April 28th. So this is considered preliminary as the survey is still in the field. And I also want to acknowledge that the funding for this has come from the Utah Center for Promotion of Work Equity Research through the pilot program. Uh, Dr. Benson received that award and Reach U2, which is a mentoring program for undergraduates. And we will have a summer intern who will help with focus groups and preparing the case study. So responses received through April 28th were 158. We deleted those um, respondents who said they had some other role than a staff person at the time that we were focusing on for our analysis. And we also deleted uh, two people who completed only the demographic portion that left us with 141 surveys to analyze. <clears throat> this gives you a sense of who the sample is. So 77% identify as women um, and 75% uh, reported full-time staff work. Uh, the majority of, or the largest portion of respondents came from the School of Business, but we do represent a variety of other places on campus. So fairly broad representation. Because of the article about uh, what were best practices, we wanted to ask people about the kinds of interactions they had with their supervisors. So we'll start down here. Um, the frequency of interaction, 44% said they had the same levels before, some were higher, some were lower. Um, the next thing we asked about was, was that level of interaction appropriate or the right amount that you needed? And most people felt that um, they were getting the level of interaction they needed. So strongly agree and somewhat agree are in the green. And then the disagree somewhat and strongly are in the orange color. Um, and so you can see that the majority felt like they were getting the kind of interaction they needed. The last thing we asked about was, did they feel supported by their supervisor. And we also asked about coworkers. And if you add the percentages up together here, you'll see that in both categories, we're at 90% or higher. So generally speaking, staff felt supported. Um, and I've listed here for you some of the ways that they felt supported. Um, and so uh, I think overall, people had a pretty positive experience um, in, in the way the remote work um, and subsequent iterations of how we worked uh, rolled out. We asked about productivity. Um, first of all, over 75% had worked remotely for at least 10 months, uh, many of them longer than that. Uh, they reported, staff reported having some of them with an increase in work. So working more hours was about 35%. As we look at the literature, Leo Philo, which was one of the articles we had um, looked at in the background said about two thirds ended up with uh, reporting increased work. Um, some of that difference may be due to the timing of when the question was asked. So the um, Leo Philo study was conducted early on in the pandemic, ours clearly is later. And so things may have sort of calmed down in terms of hours. Um, we asked about productivity over half said they had higher than previous, uh, than their pre-pandemic uh, productivity. Um, and about 35% said about the same. So productivity doesn't seem to have been negatively impacted to a great extent. And when we asked about what people would like going forward, into the future, 70% said they would prefer a hybrid setting and 20% said they would prefer being fully remote. So only a small fraction are really interested in coming back to full-time in-person work in the way that we had before the pandemic. 
we asked about work-life balance and specifically we wanted to know about the kinds of extra work people were doing either for children or adults for whom they had caregiving responsibilities. So we asked about educational needs for children, social needs for children, physical needs for adults. This is things like running errands and grocery shopping and those kinds of things. And then social needs for adults who may have felt more isolated. And so what we find is that um, with these four categories, I'll, I'll draw your attention here to this middle row. Um, we're, we're reporting means and medians, but basically um, men were picking up more work in essentially all four of those areas as were women. So we don't really see a difference there. Um, and, but if you look at the amount of time per week that they were spending, um, you can see that women were reporting a minimum of nine additional hours on average using the median, whereas men were reporting about four additional um, hours per week. And so that, this is where we start to see the difference. So everybody's picking up extra work, but women are picking up more time in that work. And so that sort of aligns with what was reported in the previous studies um, that women were more impacted. <clears throat> when we asked about finances, um, about 87% received some form of financial assistance. You can see that the two big ones here are stimulus through the CARES Act in 2020 and stimulus through the um, ARP Act in 2021. And um, so almost everyone received some sort of assistance. Um, the changes that people made to reduce their expenditures uh, came in the form of changes in discretionary spending. So people reported things like uh, spending less money on food because they weren't going out for food or less money on gas because they weren't driving or um, economizing in some way, moving in with um, other people to reduce their housing. But really discretionary spending was the largest category there. We also asked about health and we asked in terms of physical health and mental health. middle is where uh, people were. Either their health was the same or their health was worse. We have very reported better or unsure. Um, and it's about the same amount who report worse health for both physical and mental health at about 45% each. So in summary, in terms of work, um, people the staff that we interviewed here at the, or that responded to the survey here at the University of Utah, fewer of them reported increased hours due to the pandemic than we see in the reports that looked at other places in the country. Overall, people felt supported in the um, move to remote work or hybrid work. Um, and they also reported that they had experience with remote work. They could be productive that way. and the majority favor hybrid work going forward. Um, when we looked at comparisons between women and men, what we found was a non-significant, uh, from a statistical standpoint, increase in the hours of caregiving for women compared to men, um, with the median that we reported of nine versus four hours per week at a minimum. This happens because um, we asked them to report in intervals of hours, so one to five. So at the minimum, we took one as the minimum. So people could be higher than this, but um, this is what we were seeing at the minimum. And then the other things we found were this report of decreased health, a significant portion of the sample reported decreased health, both physically and mentally, um, that a very large number, almost 90% received financial assistance in some form. Um, and typically federal, and that uh, about two thirds made changes to their discretionary spending um, or other types of spending to reduce their financial outgo. <clears throat> Where we think this is headed in the future is that there's a tremendous amount of work to do in the policy area. Um, workers clearly favor hybrid work, but there are implications for how we impl implement that. Um, so if it's true that uh, workers who are experienced are successful at hybrid work or remote work, how do we think about that when we bring on new employees? Um, how do we train them? How do we build their skills over time? Um, how do we set expectations and evaluate them in a remote setting? And um, I think there's also work to be done in terms of 
uh, when teams need to be built to, to work on particular problems, how do we do that with a mixture of in-person, fully remote and hybrid? Um, I had mentioned that there was an additive effect associated with uh, being a woman and also having care for children. Um, and this ties into a framework of intersectionality where different levels of disadvantage can be additive. And so we'd like to apply that frame as we continue to gather responses and expand our analysis. How do we think about how race and ethnicity impact people, how their uh, level of seniority impacts them, how levels of disability impact them. So that's future work that we'll be doing with the survey. In terms of future work on this particular study, we have plans to look at faculty, staff, and students to determine whether or not their needs are different, whether the impacts to them are different. We will also be doing the folks groups where we will want to ask about um, the concept of resilience and what, what leads people to feel successful in that area. Um, certainly we'll be exploring policy with them. And given that we anticipate there will be other kinds of disruptions besides this pandemic, um, we'd like to think about how do we prepare for the next disruption. Uh, these are the resources we used in case anybody wants to take a look at any of those. And then finally, I will leave it here for questions and discussion. Thank you. Great. I would say thank you, Lisa, but she's not here, but thank you, Lisa. So anyway, um, we are, uh, we can answer questions. Um, Scott and I are both here to do that. So, you know, this is a preliminary look at some of our information and we um, survey is still active and uh, we are still getting responses as we move forward. So it's good. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, that's fine. Um, we will move on and um, we will introduce um, Dr. Uh, Valerie Flattes from the College of Nursing. She is the inaugural Associate Dean for the University of Utah College of Nursing. She's also an Associate Professor um, clinical in the primary care DMP program and the gerontology interdisciplinary program. Um, she um, is the specialty track director of the adult gerontology program for DMP. She's been teaching at the College of Nursing for over 20 years. Her work in diversity and equity spans several years of involvement in the community as well as in health sciences. So um, we will let um, her talk, take it away. Hello, my name is Valerie Flattis. I am the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the College of Nursing. I am coming to you today to talk about the disproportionate impact of a pandemic on women in underserved communities. COVID-19 threw us all for a loop to about two and a half years ago. And I didn't plan to spend two and a half years working from home during the pandemic. And I remember thinking about people who were working in jobs where they made a minimum wage or lower and who were living paycheck to paycheck. And I remember feeling confused about the information we were given by various government entities and I felt like if I was confused, I wondered what people were thinking and feeling who had less medical knowledge. And in looking at data that was collected during that time, both qualitatively and quantitatively, showed me that there was a lot of confusion as well as a lot of misinformation that was out there related to the pandemic. So the question that came to mind for me was, how closely do we want to examine the data? And then how do we make the necessary changes regarding health disparities, social determinants of health and health equity? And as you can see, the impact on Blacks and Hispanics more than uh, non-white, non-Hispanic whites was 2.8 times higher. And then for American Indians and Alaskan Natives, 
it was 2.6 times higher. COVID-19 affected everyone across every sector of the economy. And the folks who were most affected were people who were from underserved communities. And it depended on where you lived, what your zip code was. There has been some research in recent years regarding zip code having an impact on the health of a neighborhood and also zip code having an impact on access to care. So it depended on where you lived. And an example that I think of is I'm thinking about purchasing a new house, especially if it's in a different neighborhood. Like you're, if you have school-aged children, you're going to consider the schools, but you're also going to look at what resources are available in the neighborhood. Also, what services the community has available. A good number of people don't have that option. And many live in areas where there are less resources available. And part of that is based on socioeconomic status. Part of that is based on what type of job they have and what resources are available to them financially. And then I also think about rural areas and access to resources and services in those areas. And for some people, access to those services could be miles away. I also thought about racism as a public health issue and that racism is a threat to overall health. And what came out during the pandemic was the overarching effect of health disparities with folks from un underserved communities and especially people of color. It's stressful. Racism is very stressful. We know that one's immune response can be lowered because of stress. And then that toxic stress can cause a lifetime of psychological scars. Thinking about women as well as underserved communities in terms of the effect and the impact of the pandemic. And I already mentioned the impact on social determinants of health. I mentioned the impact of racism. And we've had huge losses of workers from the workforce, especially women. Um, and the healthcare system is continuing to lose workers and quality of care will be affected because of that and has been affected. And the service sector employment has been affected like restaurants and entertainment, the entertainment industry. Restaurants were, some restaurants were closed for a long time. Some owners of some restaurants had to think of other ways to secure an income for themselves and their employees. And the government stepped in and offered some payments to some people. And we know what the impact of that was. Financial insecurity increased. And we also know that access to health care was decreased depending on if the clinic was open or if they were doing telehealth or if folks had insurance coverage and they could go to that particular clinic or hospital or if they lacked health insurance. And other services were impacted. And the pandemic isn't over. In my opinion, it's not over. Kate Power wrote an article around the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the care burden of women and families. And in the article, she talked about the care economy. And it's the work that's not recognized that encompasses raising children, cooking, cleaning, the things that happen every day. 
And the care economy is the invisible and unpaid work of women. Globally, women and girls are responsible for 75% of unpaid care and domestic work in homes and communities every day. There were other factors that were related to the pandemic. I have some listed here, but I'm sure you could think of others as well. And I had already mentioned the widespread economic insecurity, also the threat to psychological safety, that we had more mental health issues. There were more people who were overdosing on opiates. There were people who were dying because they were afraid to go for health care. Um, and they had conditions that caused morbidity and mortality. And there was an impact on overall well being for everyone. We tend to be very social people, and it impacted our well being. And that's why I think a lot of people couldn't wait to get out of their homes to get back out to being social again. And then, of course, I had already mentioned the impact on children and childcare. Some school districts had to develop creative ways for children to be able to access the internet. Um, and then because some kids didn't have internet access at home. And then I also found um, an NPR um, posting or an NPR uh, article related to the Utah Women in Leadership Project. Susan Madsen is the director, and she discussed findings from a survey of women in Utah on NPR. Um, and the survey substantiates the things I mentioned previously, that it's, it was quite a challenge. And that stress increased due to the lack of the flexibility with work, women of color were um, affected more and they struggled and had bigger challenges in the state of Utah. More research is needed to examine the impact of the pandemic. And community health workers were the folks that I just had to say they deserve some credit for going out to the communities that they lived in. And they're, they're a bridge between the community and the healthcare providers and access. And they were encouraging people and educating people about testing, vaccines, and boosters. And those are the, they are the folks who can be our partner in achieving optimal health in underserved communities. They look like the people we would like to serve. We need better data collection in the underserved community and we need to disaggregate the data so that there we can see who really is being affected. Um, by pandemics or anything else that occurs in various communities related to the social determinants of health. Thank you, and I will take questions. Great, thank you, Valerie. That's lovely. You know, it sort of mirrors some of the things that we're finding too, especially about the childcare and the hours. Yes, thank you for saying that. It was like, yeah, but yeah, we have that. Okay, good. So um, uh, questions. Oh, okay, so Kathleen has a comment. Um, thank you for outlining all of our challenges. Um, how do you think um, we go, where do you, how do you think we can move forward from here? What do we need to do to get back on track? And how do we re-engage? Like there's a bunch of questions here and, you know, and then there ought to be world peace in here too. So anyway, Valerie, what do you think? Well, I think that what we what we ought to do is we really need to pull together 
probably a coalition or a task force that involves the youth system, but also people from the community as well as community health workers. And that work is going on. So I think we just need to pull it together a little bit better so that we can really look at the challenges and um, decide what we need to do to try to decrease the disparities in the various communities. And I, I really do think we, we should not forget our rural communities as well. Yeah, no, really good points there. I think sometimes we forget that Utah is not only a rural state, but it's a frontier state. And we have communities who are really in need right now. Yeah, no, excellent points. We do, yeah. Yeah, other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Valerie. That was wonderful, good. All right, so I um, am gonna turn the time over to Dr. Michael Varner who's gonna move us into talking about women's reproductive uh, research, the we're her scholars. So Michael, take it away. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, <clears throat> I think for those of you who have been uh, at uh, previous uh, uh, women's health sym symposia, you know that uh, our the OBGYN department has had the good fortune to have uh, NIH funded K-12 uh, programs for uh, a junior faculty uh, research career development uh, over the last uh, se seven years. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we, we have a, a, a K-12 programs called uh, Women's Reproductive Health Research, which is uh, a mouthful. And so people always refer to it as we're her, but uh, it is a career development award for research oriented uh, uh, OBGYN junior clinician uh, of faculty. Uh, we started on this program in, in 2015, and uh, there are 14 other such programs uh, around the, the country, uh, each of which have two um, uh, scholars. And the, the spots provide 75% uh, of uh, FTE protected time for research and research training. And so you might ask if you look at the, the, uh, the schedule, well, why are there three people on that list? And uh, it turns out that we've uh, recently had a, um, a transition. Nathan Blue um, has uh, tr uh, transitioned off at the end of February and uh, uh, we, we have a new uh, faculty in the urogynecology division who you're about to meet, um, uh, Whitney uh, uh, Hendrickson, who uh, has uh, joined us and is uh, uh, the newest uh, uh, Werher scholar at uh, uh, Utah. The, the Werher program itself is uh, uh, unchanged from an administrative standpoint. Bob Silver, our department chair, is still the PI. Uh, I'm still the program director, and Dave Turok is still the, the um, uh, recruitment director, and Leanne Johnson is the glue that holds uh, not only the Werher program together, but the Center of Excellence on Women's Health and any number of other uh, uh, projects. So uh, all three of the uh, uh, scholars, and I, sh I should mention the third is uh, Rob Dude, who's uh, uh, continued uh, year two and who we're looking forward to uh, um, uh, continuing on into uh, uh, the next academic year as well. But all three scholars have recorded um, uh, brief presentations. Uh, we're we're uh, uh, holding this to 10 minutes uh, a piece. So, uh, with that, I, I just take a moment to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Hendrickson. Uh, Dr. Hendrickson has, um, uh, obtained her, her MD degree from the University of Ma Massachusetts, went cross country to UC San Diego for residency, and then back cross country uh, to Duke for a female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery uh, fellowship, and almost back across the country again, finally, to uh, to Utah, where she started in um, in March. Um, during her her fel fellowship, she began uh, uh, developed an interest uh, and, and expertise on applying uh, 
uh, complex statistical approaches to uh, uh, evaluation of clinical data and to developing clinical tools to help uh, both clinicians and patients uh, make more personalized uh, informed treatment uh, uh, decisions. Um, and uh, what uh, she hopes and we expect to see is that um, over the course of her, her uh, participation in the WERHER program that she'll uh, apply these novel statistical techniques to evaluate outcomes after treatments for um, uh, urgency uh, urinary uh, incontinence, and um, um, and also I guess to to eluc elucidate from that subtypes of uh, of this uh, uh, persistent uh, uh, problem. And so, uh, with that, I'll let her tell you how she plans to go about that. Thank you for that introduction. So this talk is entitled Treatment Response Over Time in Women with Urgency and Incontinence, a Novel Approach. All right, so just briefly, urgency incontinence is the leakage of urine associated with a sudden desire to void without other cause. Approximately 30% of women over the age of 30 experience urgency incontinence, and the prevalence continues to increase with increasing age. The pathophysiology is quite complex, but we do know it's associated with mood disorders, diabetes mellitus, age, frailty, cardiovascular disease, and other disorders. In terms of treatment, we typically start with behavioral modifications and physical therapy, and then move on to medications. And our third line therapy includes onobotulinum toxin A or Botox, sacral neuromodulation, and percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. I'll be focusing on Botox and sacral neuromodulation. And very briefly, Botox is a cystoscopic injection, which causes paralysis of the detrusor muscle by acting at the nerve terminal, whereas sacral neuromodulation involves implanting an electrode into either the S3 or S4 foramen and likely modulates the afferent signals from the bladder. Now, both of these procedures are considered nearly equivalent in terms of outcomes, so we're currently offering them both to all patients who have failed paratherapy. So what do we know so far about these two therapies? Well, there was a well-designed multi-center randomized control trial that was conducted by the NICHD's Public Floor Disorders Network, or PFDN. And this study looked at women with refractory originary incontinence, meaning those who had failed prior therapy. And these women were randomized to either Botox or sacral neuromodulation and followed for about 24 months. Now, the great thing about this trial is that they recruited many outcomes at frequent time intervals over the 24 months, including bladder diary data, post void residuals, urinalyses, and many patient reported outcomes. Specifically, for my interest, they included both mobility and mood. Now, the primary outcome for the Rosetta trial was change from baseline in daily urgency contest episodes over six months. And they analyzed these outcomes similar to how most studies do and that's using a linear mix model or a repeated measure. So what a linear mix model is, is in essence, it averages data at each time point. So for this study, um, time points between baseline and six months, and it gives you a single value. So the results for the Rosetta trial showed that Botox, there was on average a 3.9 reduction in daily urgent urinary incontinence episodes, whereas for sacral neuromodulation, there was a reduction of 3.3 in daily urgent incontinence episodes. But there is so much more to treatment outcomes than just this single number. And you can see that here. So this is one patient from the Rosetta trial who received sacral neuromodulation. So the x-axis shows time with baseline on the left and 24 months on the right. And the y-axis is number of daily urgency incontinence episodes. So this woman started with around six urgency incontinence episodes per day and improved after her inner stim, but then kind of bounced back to where her baseline was and remained nearly at her baseline for the 24 months. This patient, on the other hand, is another uh, subject from the Rosetta trial who received sacral neuromodulation, but she had a bit of a different treatment outcome. So again, the x-axis here is baseline on the left um, and 24 months on the right. And then the y-axis is the number of daily urgency incontinence episodes. 
So this patient again, started around the same. So she had five or journey incontinence episodes a day, but after her inner stim, she had a dramatic improvement and I kind of kept that improvement over the, the 24 months. So when you place these two side by side, you can really see the difference in their treatment response. And giving both of these women just one number really is not the most accurate prediction of their expected outcome. So the first aim of this grant is to use the data from the Rosetta trial to evaluate the use of applying a recurrent event analysis to understand both objective and subjective treatment failure over 24 months. So the recurrent event analysis is in essence used to describe these fluctuations in urogenary incontinence episodes per time. So again, it doesn't give you just one value, it gives you this description of these fluctuations. Our second aim is to look at the association of modifiable factors with treatment failure over 24 months. And specifically, we'll be looking at change in mobility, change in mood, change in cognition, um, the occurrence of urinary tract infection and voiding dysfunction. Our third aim is to evaluate longitudinal patterns of treatment failure over 24 months. So if we come back to our two patients who receive sacral modulation, this objective aims to classify these patients into different categories of treatment response. So one potential outcome for this aim is classifying the patient on the left as a persistent failure and the patient on the right as a persistent success. And my final aim is to evaluate subtypes of patients receiving treatment for urgent incontinence and um, evaluate this association with different treatment failure subtypes from the previous aim. So that might look like um, a woman who has recurrent urinary tract infections, maybe impaired mobility, maybe anxiety or depression, and all of those characteristics may be associated with this persistent failure subtype. Whereas maybe an obese woman, someone with pretty consistent mobility and diabetes mellitus, perhaps those uh, characteristics are associated with uh, persistent success treatment failure subtype. So hopefully um, in terms of future directions with this grant, um, I'm hoping that it will change the way that we analyze trials involving urgent incontinence and allowing us to have more uh, information and data. Um, it may also pave the way for a large prospective cohort study exploring the impact of mobility, frailty, and mood disorders over time on the natural history of and treatment for urgent incontinence. Um, it might also lead to a study evaluating the use of ancillary treatments, such as physical rehabilitation um, and cognitive behavioral therapy on urgent incontinence. And finally, it may lead to the development of prediction models for specific longitudinal treatment subtypes. All right, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, any uh, questions for Dr. Hendrickson? So for the, this is Deanna, um, I can turn my video on. So you said Botox was the first, what did you say was the first treatment? For regenerating? Yeah. So typically we start with behavioral modification and PT. Um, no, after that, like the more interventional. Oh, after some medications. And then the three, the third line therapies include Botox, sigrenor modulation and PTNS. So how is the Botox delivered? Yeah. So we deliver it cystoscopically. So with a little uh, cystoscope, so a camera that goes into the, uh, into the urethra and the bladder, and then we inject us with a, a needle, the Botox um, within the detrusor muscle. So it's just one injection. No. So inter it's great like question. So the, I'm not a clinician. So this is like, no, that's okay. To yeah. Me. yeah. So historically it's been about 20 injections. There's recent data oh. in the past, maybe two years where we've been, um, looking at a decreased number of injections, like anywhere between two to five, um, but typically the same volume. So like hundred units of Botox is our starting dose. So it'd be the same volume, regardless of the, um, the number of injections. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Had a hard time visualizing that. So, <laughs> sure. The, Dr. Scott has a question in the chat here. Is, uh, is there anything about the technical placement of the device that might affect the, it, the success? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So for, I'm assuming you're talking about sacral neuromodulation. Um, and there are some things that we, that actually Rosetta did collect in terms of placement. So, um, you know, when we place the device, there are um, a handful of different electrodes that we evaluate. So we look at both motor and sensory response, and we're also looking at the um, amplitude that that basically causes those motor and sensory res responses. And if the amplitude is less than two, um, then typically uh, that has been associated with improved um, success of the device. Um, there is a um, paper that came out of Rosetta that um, I actually don't think it's quite published yet, but they're looking at um, different factors in, in placement. Um, so those kind of quote technical factors and success. Um, so TBD on that. Uh, and uh, Rob uh, Dude has a quest question. Uh, do you think different failure patterns might indicate one therapy over another or even skipping first or second line therapies? Yeah, exactly. So it'll be really interesting to see if there are, um, if the failure subtypes differ by treatment um, options. So, you know, it would be great if, if ultimately from that specific aim, we found that, you know, with sacred arm modulation, someone isn't going to do well, um, you know, but maybe a similar patient who received Botox from that trial actually does well. So the kind of future aims in terms of developing a prediction model could potentially um, help answer that question where you can put in patient characteristics and then, you know, the outcome would be your predict, you know, if you go with Botox, you're like more likely going to have a persistent success. And if you go with, you know, interstim more likely a failure. Um, so hopefully we will, we will have that. And, uh, Nathan blue has a, a, a question. Do you suspect that the uh, response to neuromodulation is driven by genetic or other factors like medication use or obstetric history? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't think that we um, necessarily have um, a great idea as to who does better with sacral neuromodulation versus Botox. Um, I don't think anyone has really looked at genetics actually. Um, so, you know, maybe that is a, something to explore. Um, and you know, it, it certainly um, in people who have um, a neurologic component to their urge and incontinence, you know, we know they do just as well with sacral neuromodulation compared to people who don't have a neurologic component. Um, so, you know, OB history, if that, if there is a, a you know, pedental nerve injury, then, um, you know, that may not really matter, but there could be other things that we just don't know that affect outcome. One other question in the, the chat that, that, uh, uh, ask if uh, you've had patients with a history of sexual ab abuse be open to this kind of treatment? Yeah, that's another good question. So there's been a lot of um, research in the past, I know maybe 10 years, but also in the past couple of years more, and, and Ingrid was a part of this as well, looking at um, uh, not just sexual abuse, but also PC PTSD in um, veterans. And there is higher rates of overactive bladder in those who've experienced abuse. Um, I don't think anyone's looked at whether um, people do respond to treatment, um, if they've have a history of abuse or not, but, um, you know, in my experience, um, they've been accepting of, of Botox and, and interstim. Um, so I haven't had any, you know, people who have um, been concerned about it, but great questions. Great. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for, uh, both the presentation and, uh, uh, those uh, responses. You know, I, uh, I think I could safely say that I, I am not a early uh, adapter when it comes to biostatistical uh, techniques, but uh, this, this concept that you're utilizing of recurrent event analysis really is, uh, I think, an eye-opener. Well, it was an eye-opener to me anyway, in terms of, of uh, uh, trying to, to accurately uh, assess uh, really any outcome that varies over over time that uh, the idea that with a single snapshot is a picture of what's actually happened um, in a something that that bounces around like some of those examples that you showed really is an important concept that that all of us in in uh, clinical research uh, should be thinking about uh, uh, utilizing so uh, I really appreciate your, your putting that out there for, for all of us. 
Yeah, so, um, in the interest of uh, of staying on time, uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, Rob Dude. Uh, Rob is uh, assistant professor in the uh, gynecologic oncology division in our department, and uh, and took something of at least a geographically circular uh, route to arrive in Utah. Uh, started in Michigan with, in medical school. Uh, to the University of Pennsylvania, for, uh, you know, Michigan undergrad, right, and and uh, uh, yeah, and medical school, Pennsylvania University of Pennsylvania for uh, OBGYN residency and a master's degree, uh, then to MD Anderson for his uh, fellowship, and and arrived in Utah in the midst of the COVID pandemic in uh, uh, the summer of uh, uh, 2020. Uh, he's in his uh, Second year uh, uh, on the um, the worker, and uh, it really is uh, a great addition to our department. He's he he is the the first really committed physician scientist in the gynecologic oncology division that we've had, and we're delighted that he's uh, here. Uh, besides being a a a, a very competent um, gynecologic oncology uh, surgeon. Uh, he has a, an, an expertise and interest in um, in epidemiology and more specifically in, in uh, precision population health with uh, relation to gynecologic cancers. So uh, with that, we'll let Rob tell us about uh, um, his uh, journey to date. Today, I'll be talking about genetic testing in patients with gynecologic cancers. I have no conflicts of interest. Um, briefly, I'll be talking about genetic testing basics, genetic testing goals, genetic testing in the practice of gynecologic cancer care, specifically looking at ovarian, cervix, and endometrial cancers. And then I have a proposal on an expanded role of genetic testing in endometrial cancer. Genetic, te um, gen genetic testing itself can be conducted in what we would call germline testing, looking for inherited genes inherited from a patient's um, family members or else specifically looking at somatic or acquired um, genes, which can be present at just certain affected tissues, specifically in my world, what would be a patient's tumor. Now, um, we can perform genetic testing a couple of different ways, um, the majority of which is done through DNA tests, um, which can be done through um, either fish or Sanger sequencing or whole genome sequencing, which are mostly now just in the research setting. And now in the um, care delivery setting are usually done through commercial whole exome or next generation sequencing tests. It is important to note that these are somewhat slower, requiring about 10 weeks. Um, they can be costly, costing up to four to $7,000, but they are certainly comprehensive. Now, also available to us are looking at the downstream products of um, specific gene loci, and these would be conducted through protein-based tests or immunohistochemistry or IHC tests. These are fast and cheap, um, but unfortunately, they're very limited in their scope, looking at only one specific protein. Now, the goals of genetic testing um, kind of track along the different um, types of testing. So in germline testing, um, we're hoping that we can then identify specific um, high-risk um, cancers um, within the patient themselves who is being tested. And it can then engage in either prevention or surveillance of, um, for those high-risk cancers. And then um, we can test that patient's family member using what we call a cascade testing paradigm um, and can then engage in prevention and surveillance of those patients' family members to benefit the population. Within somatic testing, um, this is usually done in the setting of um, helping with diagnosis, but can also help um, for um, identifying certain indicated therapies. Now, looking at um, the specific um, practice patterns for epithelial ovarian cancer, um, we do indeed perform um, IHC um, protein testing for a P53 protein, which helps us with the diagnosis of the specific, specific type of, an, of ovarian cancer. And then um, for over a decade, we've been calling for universal germline testing for the BRCA and other breast and ovarian cancer genes. Um, this is conducted um, on a panel um, next-generation sequencing test. 
If that is negative in a patient with an epithelial ovarian cancer, then we will move on to somatic testing, um, looking for the, um, these BRCA and the other panel of genes, as well as something called HRD. And if we find that, or in either the germline or the somatic testing, um, then the patient likely would benefit from something called a PARP inhibitor, um, given as a maintenance therapy after completion of surgery and chemotherapy. In cervix cancer, um, genetic testing can be used in the diagnosis, um, specifically looking for E6 and E7 proteins that are related to the HPV virus. Um, and then looking for therapeutic implications, we'll test for something called PDL1 to see if it's present at a high enough level on the tumor surface um, that the patient would likely benefit from pembrolizumab therapy. Now for endometrial cancer, um, we first will um, engage in somatic testing for um, kind of the same name for, or different names rather, for the same thing, um, which is HRD, MMRD, or Lynch syndrome proteins. Um, this is done through universal IHC protein testing on a slide of the patient's tumor. Um, and then this is followed up with um, next generation sequencing um, if we do find the um, protein abnormalities to see if the patient does um, suffer from a germline mutation. If they do suffer from the germline mutation, then we can engage in um, risk reduction and surveillance of different Lynch cancers and can then um, also engage in that cascade testing to hopefully then benefit the patient's family member as well on the population level. Now, if the um, patient is unfortunate enough to have a recurrent endometrial cancer, we know that any of these specific um, uh, mutations um, would likely indicate a benefit from pembrolizumab therapy. Now, endometrial cancer um, is typically defined by histology, um, and the vast majority of which are specific endometrioid histology um, of cancer. Yet we know that um, though it's a large proportion of the cancers, they all have different unpredictable behaviors with differing um, survival risks and different, differencing recurrence risks as well. Now, almost a decade ago, um, uh, some, a study was conducted within the Cancer Genome Atlas um, which performed a cluster analysis to identify four t key molecular subtypes of endometrial cancers shown here with the different colors. Two years later, um, this was then conducted on a population level um, within Canada, actually, um, which then confirmed these four different molecular subtypes and came up with a testing strategy um, using both IHC tests and next generation sequencing. These tests then held true, um, performing these molecular subtypes to then show that they have four very distinct survival patterns shown in the Kaplan Meier curve at the right. Now, this molecular subtyping, though called for um, years ago, um, really was most recently last year um, indicated uh, to be performed in higher risk cancers by our own NCCN. And then always ahead of us a bit, the um, European guidelines um, also were accompanied with some treatment recommendations that vary based on the patient's tumor's molecular subtype. Yet few centers are performing this universal subtyping, ourselves included, are guilty of not performing this yet. And it's likely because, as I had said, the mixture of protein and NGS um, testing, um, really the NGS testing is the bottleneck here because it can be both costly and time consuming. So I have a project proposing to um, uh, identify the most cost-effective strategy of assigning these promised subtypes in high-risk endometrial cancers, um, getting us in line with the NCCN guidelines. And we'll be conducting a cost-effectiveness analysis using existing data. And I hypothesize that a, a novel targeted sequence, sequential staining and sequencing strategy will be the most cost-effective. Next, um, I want to measure the relative risk of recurrence for promised subtypes in patients with clinical pathologically considered low-risk endometrial cancers who typically don't receive any adjuvant therapy. I'll be conducting a nested case control study of these low-risk patients from the University of Utah as well as IHC hospitals. I'm hypothesizing that the rare and more um, aggressive P53 abnormal subtype will indeed have the highest risk of recurrence. Next steps um, after this project will be to implement then the most cost-effective strategy in high-risk cancers here at the Huntsman and IHC. 
um, as well as then um, if um, the second aim pans out to then perform universal molecular subtyping for all patients with endometrial cancer. With the goal of delivering population precision medicine to decrease unnecessary treatments, um, but also decrease the recurrence and improve endometrial cancer survival outcomes. I want to acknowledge the following um, sources as well as mentors. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, questions from the group? Well, Rob, I think you might get off, might have gotten off easy. Oh, here we are. Do, do you recommend uh, 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 using screening of uh, women at the population level? Unfortunately, specifically for either ovarian or else Lynch syndrome with endometrial cancer, um, the prevalence probably isn't just isn't quite high enough to make it kind of cost effective at this point. Um, there have been um, indications, though, that in calls for maybe screening um, all women over age 65 uh, would be one of the kind of population based um, calls. But otherwise, we typically rely on that cascade um, mechanism, starting with the proband. Okay. And uh, uh, one other question about uh, insurance coverage playing into uh, uh, this testing strategy. Fortunately, yes, um, mostly from CMS services, which are, provides care for the majority or coverage for the majority of our patients who are over age 65. Um, you are allowed one genetic test in your lifetime. So if we do that on one of your tumors and you're diagnosed with a recurrence or a later tumor, you could have a completely different tumor, um, but you're not allowed to um, get it covered. So it definitely does. And we have to be thoughtful about kind of who we're genetically testing or whose tumors as well. That's amazing. Um, well, in, in the interest of, uh, of uh, uh, trying to keep ourselves on schedule for the, the day, though, thanks for a great presentation. And uh, we'll move on to a final Werher uh, scholar, Nathan Blue. Uh, Nathan uh, came to us uh, uh, from Southern California, uh, uh, OBGYN residency at LA County, USC, and then uh, Maternal Fetal Medicine Fellowship at uh, New Mexico, which is where uh, he was uh, initially inoculated with the uh, research bug, uh, it would uh, appear. And uh, uh, that uh, initial inoculation has uh, blossomed into a, a, a full-blown uh, research sepsis, I think it'd be safe to say. Uh, he's uh, um, become um, an ard ardently enthusiastic in in investigator uh, uh, looking at the 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 persistent pr um, difficulties uh, we have in the world of obstetrics of identifying uh, those those fetuses um, who who really are uh, uh, growth restricted, and uh, he he hopes that uh, he'll be able to develop uh, new tools to improve prenatal estimation of perinatal morbidity and mortality uh, to. Uh, lead to better uh, clinical decision making, both by families and uh, clinicians. So, uh, without uh, further ado, let's uh, hear from Nathan. Hi, everyone. My name is Nathan Blue. I'm a maternal fetal medicine or high risk obstetrician here at the University of Utah, and I'm really excited to present this work to you today. Thanks so much for for sharing your attention. That's me in the lower left-hand corner. Since you can't see me as I talk, you can find me on Twitter at Navy Blue. And if you see a QR code in the presentation, each on all the slides, it's the same QR code. It's just a link to the collection of references that I use uh, during the presentation. So feel free to open that up anytime you see it. Fetal growth restriction is a uh, condition where a fetus doesn't meet its growth potential, and it's important to recognize prenatally because it is a leading risk factor for preventable stillbirth. Our available strategies perform poorly, but it's important to get right because in the best case scenario, we can recognize it and prevent a stillbirth that otherwise would have occurred. But in the worst case scenario, we either over intervene in healthy fetuses or we miss sick fetuses and, uh, and otherwise preventable stillbirths take place. 
Fetal growth restriction is typically diagnosed using a curve like this. This is a widely used curve published by Frank Hadlock in 1991. The way it goes is that an ultrasound is used to measure a fetus's weight, and then that weight is plotted along the curve here. And if at the given gestational age, it falls below the 10th percentile, then fetal growth restriction is diagnosed. This project got started during a previous analysis, and we did an analysis by sex and found that the Hadlock fetal growth standard, which I just mentioned, diagnoses fetal growth restriction more than twice as often, or I should say nearly twice as often in female fetuses in black here, as in male fetuses, which are in gray. Now that was striking, but it's possible, I guess, that female fetuses have more complications, except when we analyzed the rate of complications by sex, we found the opposite, that instead of female fetuses experiencing more complications from fetal growth restriction, actually male fetuses experience higher rates of complication. And so this was a clear signal that something is wrong here, that, that the increased rate of diagnosis of fetal growth restriction in female fetuses is, uh, is an overdiagnosis. Now, an important thing to know about the Hadlock standard, which I just mentioned, is that it is sex neutral. That is to say, it generated a curve for all fetuses irrespective of sex, which makes sense because in 1991, ultrasound technology didn't really allow for consistent and easy um, identification of fetal genitalia. There are other problems with the Hadlock curve, such as that it's from a very homogeneous a white group of about 390 women in Houston, but uh, that's for another presentation. The finding that female and male fetuses are different sizes at the same gestational age is actually old news. It's, it's very well established. Um, in fact, this is a figure from 2003 showing birth weights uh, by sex at different gestational ages. And you can see clearly that female fetuses represented by the solid lines um, are smaller at virtually all gestational ages than male fetuses. Uh, so let's dig into then how this reflects in current practice. Well, in modern practice, uh, this is accounted for. In fact, it's established well enough that all birth weight and neonatal growth charts, here, here are three relatively newer um, curves on the left. These each account for fetal sex and they publish tables and curves for male separately from female fetuses. Now, we could give a pass to Frank Hadlock in 1991, but it does not add up that more recent fetal growth standards specifically designed for prenatal application do not account for fetal sex, even though this is known. So what gives? So this is what we set out to do. We decided to assess differences in fetal growth by sex, and then to use that information to derive a sex-specific fetal growth standard. We also wanted to assess, or at least preliminarily explore the implications of applying a sex-neutral versus a sex-specific growth standard. We utilized the prospective observational cohort, which was the new mom-to-be study, this took place across eight United States centers and included just over 10,000 first-time pregnant participants. Um, they, uh, these participants underwent a fetal size assessment at four time points, three of which occurred during pregnancy, uh, shown here, and then the last one at birth. For the derivation of the sex-specific curve, we limited the cohort to low-risk pregnancies that did not have known risk factors for aberrant fetal growth, since we're trying to define and describe what is normal rather than what is likely to be abnormal. A few definitions that we use, small for gestational age, which is frequently a surrogate for the label of fetal growth restriction, was uh, a fetal weight or a newborn size less than the 10th percentile for gestational age. 
and large for gestation, gestational age is a size greater than the 90th percentile. These are our uh, basic results, the, the, the basic um, background characteristics of the cohort. You can see that age and BMI are unremarkable. There is, ver there is a representation from, uh, from different race and ethnicity groups, though not perfectly representative of the United States. The mean gestational age at delivery was the latter part of the 39th week. The birth weight um, averaging three and a third kilograms and 49% uh, of newborns were female. This is a scatter plot illustrating the data points um, from the different time points in pregnancy. Um, we really just utilized fetal uh, assessment starting at visit two, which started just before 16 weeks, um, since that's the earliest that fetal weight is meaningfully uh, described uh, clinically. You can see that um, in blue is our vi uh, data points from visit two, in gray from visit three, these are ultrasounds, and then in black, the birth weights. There's a gap between the visit three and the birth weight assessments because most of the these participants had their research ultrasounds before 34 weeks. These are the smoothed curves from the data um, that plot the, the existing or the known Hadlock standard, as well as the male and female specific standards derived from our data. You can see that the Hadlock standard expects fetuses to be larger than both the female and uh, male stand, uh, standards from this cohort. And you can also see that the male fetuses in the dashed line are larger than the female fetuses uh, in the dotted line. And that appears to be a small difference, but it is statistically significant. And if you're wondering whether such a visibly small difference can make uh, a difference clinically, I will show you. So here's what we had shown before, that the Hadlock standard diagnoses smallness here at considered SGA at nearly twice the rate in female fetuses in the light gray as in male fetuses in the dark gray. When we applied our newly derived sex-specific uh, standard to the cohort, that resolved the disparity. Looking at large for gestational age, we find a similar phenomenon, the Hadlock standard diagnoses more males as being too large than females in the light gray. That's a statistically significant difference. And applying the sex-specific standard resolves the disparity. Although it does diagnose more fetuses or newborns overall as being large. So this illustrates how those labels actually uh, matter when respect, with respect to fetal sex. So you can see here, uh, looking at the female newborns, that those that are considered to be normally grown by both sex neutral and sex specific standards experience morbidity at a rate of about 9%. Now, those who were considered small by the Hadlock standard, but then are reclassified as normal by the sex-specific standard, they actually have a lower rate of morbidity than the baseline group. And this is really just to emphasize that these are being misdiagnosed as high risk when in fact they are uh, a very low risk group. And that pattern is not exactly the same in the male newborns. Those reclassified from being small to, the, to being considered normal by the sex-specific standard have a comparable rate of morbidity as the baseline risk group. But the difference in, in differences here between the sexes show that female fetuses are disproportionately affected. So in conclusion, firstly, fetal growth differs by sex. This is not new, but we again found it to be true in our cohort. Secondly, the sex neutral standards, such as the Hadlock standard, overdiagnose fetal growth restriction in female fetuses, and this disproportionately affects female fetuses over male fetuses. Our sex specific standard needs to be validated before use. However, I just want to suggest that 
as we move forward in validating and testing this curve, that our benchmark is not only prediction of morbidity, but perhaps that resolving the disparity in overdiagnosis is important in and of itself. And that's because here is just the example of the intensive surveillance regimen that uh, pregnant people who are diagnosed with fetal growth restriction undergo. They undergo multiple ultrasounds for fetal growth as well as umbilical artery Doppler. They undergo weekly fetal heart rate monitoring and frequently delivery before 39 weeks, even when all of the monitoring has been reassuring. Now, uh, receiving that label of fetal growth restriction, not to mention the monitoring and early delivery, uh, really represents meaningful and measurable stress and harm for this group. And it's, and it's not right that that disproportionately affects female fetuses. And I, I love memes, so <laughs> this one represents, I think, what a sex neutral standards do. So here we are in the top panel, screening for fetal growth restriction, trying to do a good thing. We apply a sex neutral standard, which is the standard of care, and we think we're doing a good thing. But then we end up disproportionately exposing female fetuses to iatrogenic harm. And uh, so this is a clear opportunity for improvement. Here's the end of my presentation. I want to thank the large group of mentors sort of across domains here at the University of Utah who have been supportive to me during my nearly four years on the WERHER um, and who continue to support me going forward. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I think we have time for uh, one question. Um, got a little bit behind schedule here. Um, here's a, uh, uh, <clears throat> a question from uh, Dr. Scott. Did you look at the association of maternal size, weight? Uh, uh, again, the issue of big people have big babies, little people have little babies in, in your analyses. Uh, we, we have looked at that, um, that, you know, it, the holy grail is to generate a fetal growth curve that is individualized for that baby's growth potential based on its genetic, you know, uh, genetically programmed growth potential. And it is already recognized that maternal size is one of the factors that's associated with non-pathologic differences in fetal growth. And actually, that was the subject of that analysis where we looked at and found the, the sex disparity in the rate of fetal growth restriction diagnosis. So that one is included. If you open the QR code, you can see what we found. Okay. Thanks for, very much, Nathan. Um, we need to take a break for a couple minutes but here, but we'll be back at uh, 3.15 for our uh, uh, <clears throat> keynote presentation. So um Take a uh, take a break for a few minutes here, and we'll see you back at uh, three fifteen. Uh, our team received a very gracious invitation um, from the conference organizers to have a plenary session focused on abortion, um, a very timely topic. You may have heard about it; it's in the news lately. And um, I reached out to the two brightest shining intellectual stars in our field, hoping that one of them might agree uh, to come here. This was then months ahead um, to Utah and uh, both agreed. So you are in for an absolute treat. And um, Lisa Harris is recorded a talk for us and then will join us uh, at a open Q and A after. And um, Lisa is a double doctor, MD, PhD, and she is the F. Wallace and, and Janet Jeffries Collegiate Professor of Reproductive Health and Professor and Associate Chair at the University of Michigan's Department of OBGYN. Uh, she's a pro also a professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Michigan's College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. She directs uh, the University of Michigan's Fellowship in Complex Family Planning, as well as the Undergraduate Health Sciences Scholars Program. Dr. Harris is a graduate of Harvard University's College and Medical School. Um, she completed a residency in OBGYN at the UCSF. 
that collectively, I believe, is known as uh, being academically bulletproof. Uh, because so many issues in reproductive health have to do as much with culture and politics as biomedical science, Dr. Harris then went on to earn a PhD in American culture. And she is now an active clinician, teacher, and researcher. And her clinical work focus on, focuses on miscarriage and family planning. She teaches across disciplines and schools at the University of Michigan. Her research is similarly interdisciplinary, exploring abortion stigma, experiences of abortion providers, race and social class stratification of reproduction, and the role of doctors' voices in the shifting culture around abortion. Lisa is an absolutely extraordinary human being and gave the best talk that I have ever heard at any academic meeting. And that statement will probably be true up until the day I pass. And she spoke more than I think 10 years ago. Um, she gave a talk at a, a meeting. I can't even remember the, what city it was in, um, where there were about 500 people in the audience and you could have heard a pin drop for a half hour. It was absolutely mesmerizing. And the topic of the talk was work that she went on to really focus on and, and publish. And, and, and it was essentially about the tension of opposites of abortion providers and the lack of conversation about what is challenging about the work, the, un, the unspoken challenges that uh, abortion providers face. So it is an absolute pleasure um, to introduce Lisa's talk and then you will get to uh, hear her in person. Um, and uh, be prepared for a, an absolutely fabulous discussion on abortion. And I'm going to tell one other very quick vignette uh, before we hit play on this recorded talk. Um, a few years ago in Salt Lake City, we had um, the annual fellowship meeting and uh, a close colleague of, of ours was getting, you know, this Lifetime Achievement Award. And Lisa and I were sitting next to each other. and um, the person who had sort of organized the event was like, I never told anyone to like speak and say some things about um, Eve Espy who was getting the award. And so she came over to us and said, would you like to talk? I was like, of course, I would love to say some really nice things about Eve. And, and then I turned and said, you know, but certainly uh, if Lisa has anything to say, uh, you know, that would be great and she should go first. And uh, she said in a really kind, and not judgmental way at all, um, knowing that I was gonna jump right in. She said, um, you know, I don't speak off the cuff. Words are really important to me and I always prepare. Hello, I'm so glad to be joining you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Dave, thank you specifically for the invitation and Leanne, thank you for all of the logistical work. I'm really grateful. I just want to name that I have a dog here in the house with me, a couple of cats, a sick teenager with COVID. Uh, so they may make all manner of appearances. I'll apologize in advance if there are any interruptions. And if I pause and go on mute for a moment, when my dog sees a rabbit outside, you will understand why. And most of all, I'm glad, I'm looking forward to joining you for the live session in just a little bit. Okay, well, I gotta say what a week it has been. When I planned a talk with this title after Row, I really did not have a sense of how real it would feel. The vision of a post row world has become quite real in the past week because as you all know, last Monday at around 9 p.m., a draft Supreme Court op opinion was leaked that basically shows that the court is very willing and in fact, happy to overturn Roe versus Wade. At that time, I was on a plane on my way home from two meetings out of town. Actually, one was an, a, a meeting of healthcare journalists uh, who wanted to hear about abortion. So I was talking about that. And the other was actually a meeting about abortion, one of the main professional organizations of doctors and organizations that provide abortion care. And this is what we talked about all weekend. I flew home Monday night 
And of course my phone was off. The wheels touched down a little after 10 PM. And as soon as they did, I took my phone off of airplane mode as I often do. And it became very clear that something big had happened while I was in the air. My phone was flooded with headlines flying across my screen, New York Times, CNN, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. And that is how I learned about the leaked Supreme Court opinion sitting on in my on the plane, still on the tarmac. And after that, ding after ding started on my phone as an hour's worth of texts from colleagues and friends flooded in, many of whom had actually been at the same meeting with me just before. I was on the plane with two of University of Michigan's family planning fellows. One was a few rows ahead of me and I just yelled to her, can you believe this? And the other was behind me, I couldn't see her, but I just wanted to scream. But I was also looking at the faces, sorry, I was in my head, I was seeing the faces of the patients I had seen the week before and who I would see or care the week after who were on the schedule for the next week. I was thinking about a young teen who needed laminaria placement, so dilator stick placement for a second trimester procedure under general anesthetic because she could not manage the discomfort of a speculum exam in the office when we'd seen her the week before. And I was thinking about the mother of six who needed a gravid hysterectomy, that's a hysterectomy while pregnant in the second trimester because she'd had many prior cesarean deliveries and her placenta had grown through the wall of her uterus into her bladder. She knew that continuing the pregnancy to deliver at term would be a life threatening process. And she wanted to be there for the children that she already had. I often work in a hospital setting. So I do see some of the most complicated patients that's often a lens on care for me. And I also work at Planned Parenthood and I see patients who are healthy enough to have care in an outpatient setting, which is most patients. And their decision to end a pregnancy is sometimes tied to their health, but more commonly tied to whatever is going on in their lives people who are already mothers who are struggling to care for the children they have, people wanting to finish high school or college, people who don't want to be trapped in a relationship with the person they became pregnant with, people who can't or don't want to be pregnant at that moment or maybe ever. Many people who if we had better social safety net systems would definitely continue their pregnancies because they want to have a baby, they just know that they can't in their current circumstances. There's a lot of tears in those situations years of our patients and very often my own. So anyway, I'm on the airplane and all of this is flashing through my head. And I walk off the jetway into the terminal. I'm walking with our two family planning fellows, one who has puffy eyes and tears just streaming down her face. And the other who like me is a little bit numb. And I'm thinking about them too, of course, they've planned a path, a career ahead with abortion care at the center and are probably now wondering what is ahead for them. And I'm also watching the throngs of people in the airport going about their evening as if nothing had happened. And I didn't understand it. They couldn't see what I saw was about to happen to life in the United States. In the days that followed, people did seem to be waking up to the jeopardy that Roe was in its precarity. And at first I have to say, I was mad that only now were people opening their eyes to that precarity. Those of us in the family planning community have been saying for a long time, this is in jeopardy. Where are, where is everybody? We've known this was going to happen, even though it was shocking to actually see the draft opinion. However, I have to say that it's actually helped me, woken me up in a way to see people's shock and outrage. No one actually believed this could happen. And that's important because it is unbelievable. I had normalized the idea that we could be a country without abortion. And that's what's not normal. So I think I awoke somewhat myself this past week to how not normal this is. So anyway, that's been my week. Thank you for letting me get that off my chest. And this is how I would like to spend the time that we have together today. The first thing I want to talk about is to share how University of Michigan is getting ready for what is ahead. I am leading along with my department chair, Dr. Dee Fenner, University of Michigan's post row task force. We started preparations very shortly after the Dobbs argument in December. That's the Mississippi case that the court is considering through which it seems like they will overturn Roe. 
So we've been thinking about this for a while since it became clear that that was the direction of things. And I remember at the time thinking, you know, who's in charge here? Who's the grown up that's going to get us ready for this moment? And then I realized that I kind of was that grown up. And so I've been spending a fair amount of my time doing those preparations. Much of the preparations we are making are clinical. And there are five big categories of our clinical thinking. What are the abortions we still can legally perform? How are we going to help people seek out-of-state care? How can we have a role in guiding people towards safe man self-managed abortion? What will happen to birth and birth rate in our institution and in the state and accordingly to neonatal care, neonatal intensive care, pediatrics practice, and do we actually have the social safety nets we need for the change that is about to come? In addition, there are other reproductive health impact that overturning Roe will have, and I want to talk about all of that thing, all of these things. The second big category of thinking here is university-wide thinking. University of Utah, like University of Michigan, is a large public institution, and there will be a impact of this decision outside of the clinical care settings. And we are figuring out how we will care for our entire university community. I also want to talk about, and this is the third thing, what does Roe does? What does Roe protect beyond abortion? I know people are already talking about contraception, marriage for same-sex couples, even interracial marriage that potentially could be jeopardized if precedents like Roe are thrown away. But I'm actually thinking about something else and I want to talk about that shortly. And then finally, if we have time, I do want to end by talking about how it is that so many people, including healthcare professionals, think about abortion only in political terms, in the political realm, and not as a health or healthcare issue. And I want to talk about how much damage that has caused. If we don't have time to talk about it, then we can get to it in the question period that follows. Okay. So I want to show you Michigan's 1931 criminal abortion law. This is on the books. This is an active law now. And it says that any person who shall willfully administer to any pregnant woman, obviously it was not using gender inclusive language, any medicine, drug, substance, or thing, whatever, or shall employ an instrument or other means, whatever, with the intent thereby to procure the miscarriage of any such woman, unless the same shall have been necessary to preserve the life of such woman, shall be guilty of a felony. And it goes on to say that if the pregnant patient dies, that would be manslaughter. So this is our law and this is an active law. It's not enforced currently because of Roe versus Wade. And it permits abortion, as you can see, only to preserve the life of the pregnant patient. So I wanna talk just for a moment about what Roe does. And this is likely review for most people that I want to make sure we're on the same page. So Roe protects abortion for any reason to the point of fetal viability, which is generally considered around 24 weeks. We could debate whether that line is an important line and what it means exactly, but that's what Roe does. Roe also protects abortion after viability if the health of a woman or pregnant person is jeopardized. And this is what people call the health exception, meaning even post viability abortion is permitted if it's in order to preserve the health of a pregnant person. And importantly, with Roe as the court's precedent, any state law banning abortion, like Michigan's 1931 criminal abortion law, can't be enforced. Roe versus Wade overrides that. So, why are we talking about this now? Well, in December, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. That's a Mississippi healthcare center that provides abortion care. And Mississippi passed a 15 week ban on abortion and Jackson Women's Health Organization challenged that ban. And that's the course, the case that the Supreme Court heard. Even before last week's draft opinion was leaked, most people expected the court with its current composition to uphold the ban and in so doing overturn or undo or gut Roe or throw abortion back to the states to determine its legality. And if those things were to happen, that would make abortion illegal in Michigan. We would go back to our 1931 law. We're not the only state that has 
the potential for abortion to become illegal should Roe be overturned. There's sort of three different categories of ways that abortion may become illegal. Michigan is here in the center in this category of states that are likely to enforce a pre-Roe ban, meaning we already have an act ban, it's just not enforced, Roe goes, we start enforcing the ban. So there are, are a handful of other states in there. Then there are states that have things called trigger bans. A trigger ban means abortion is not illegal in the state currently, but they have a law ready in the wings that will outlaw abortion if Roe is ever overturned. That's a trigger ban. And then there are states that are likely to enact new bans. So that's what you see here. And states like Wisconsin have been on and off of this list. Currently, most people think Wisconsin will also ban abortion. So what's ahead is uncertainty. In Michigan, two lawsuits are pending. Our governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and Planned Parenthood of Michigan are suing the state. They're both aiming to obtain a Michigan Supreme Court ruling that declares abortion a state constitutional right, meaning that it's implied in our state constitution already, and therefore the ban shouldn't be enforced if Roe goes. And we are also likely going to have a ballot initiative in the state. A Reproductive Health and Rights and Justice Coalition is currently collecting signatures to put the issue of abortion on the November ballot. And if this initiative were successful, abortion would be specifically enumerated in Michigan's constitution as something that is protected. Nevertheless, the outcome of all of these efforts is uncertain and we need to plan for the worst. And in a way I have to say it was a bit of a relief when the Supreme Court opinion was leaked because it made me feel that yes, it is correct that we are planning for this. It's not just a drill that we may actually need to enact our preparatory plans in the weeks or months ahead. So how is University of Michigan getting ready? Well, as I enumerate the things that we are thinking about and preparing for, I hope you will listen for this as an equity issue. In all of the things I'm about to describe, including what an abortion to preserve the life of a person means, some people, some groups, some communities will be impacted or burdened in extraordinary, extraordinary ways that other people or communities will not be. So please listen for that, the way that abortion is an equity or inequity issue that disproportionately impacts people already carrying the heaviest burdens in US life, people living on low incomes, people of color, people who experience marginalization or minoritization in a wide range of ways. So the other thing I'll say is that our preparations to date raise way more questions than they answer. Every single new voice joining our efforts brings new questions. And so thoughtful planning in this arena, really as in everything, demands a diverse set of people and voices at the table. So the first thing we're thinking about is what abortions we could continue to pr provide here in Michigan, and that is life-saving abortion care. Now, mind you, this is not my definition of life-saving, which for me is virtually every abortion, not just because abortion is safer than childbirth, but because abortion allows people to have their life unfold in a way that is important and meaningful to them. But to preserve the life in the context of the Michigan law means that someone would die without abortion care. And my family planning colleagues, as I'm sure is true here also, or in Utah as well, we sometimes perform abortions in critically ill patients in the intensive care unit in our hospital. And in those situations, it's reasonably clear that we are working to preserve the life, quote unquote, of a pregnant patient. Pregnancy demands intense work from all organ systems. I know a lot of people think, well, pregnancy just happens in the uterus, all the action is there. But pregnancy actually happens in the entire body and every organ system is involved, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, and in people who have significant underlying medical illnesses or are critically ill for whatever reason, their bodies can often not handle the additional stress that pregnancy brings. In terms of things like cardiac output, the, the amount of work that the body needs to do in pregnancy, it's actually comparable to what happens when someone's running a marathon. So it, it demands a lot of the body. And sometimes ending a pregnancy is an effort to save them because they have exacerbations of severe underlying conditions like heart failure, for example, or kidney disease, or they may have pregnancy-related illnesses in the first or second trimester, things like eclampsia, you know, pregnancy-related seizures, or chorioamnionitis, which is an infection in the uterus with sepsis, sepsis, when the infection spreads throughout the bloodstream. Ending the pregnancy is often the cure for those problems. But beyond such cases, it's actually 
unclear what precisely life-saving means. What does the risk of death have to be and how imminent must it be? Might abortion be permissible for someone say with a condition called pulmonary hypertension, which is a heart and kind of lung issue for whom we cite a 30 to 50% chance of dying with ongoing pregnancy. You know, is that, a, is that enough of a chance of dying to, for a patient to decide to have an abortion or must the risk be a hundred percent? Similarly, when we diagnose cancer during pregnancy, which sometimes happens because pregnancy is a time when people have access to healthcare that they don't always have outside of pregnancy. Sometimes when cancer is diagnosed, people decide to end their pregnancy in order to permit immediate surgical or radiation or chemotherapy treatment, all treatments that cause significant fetal injury. Will abortion be permissible in these cases or will patients have to delay treatment until after delivery? These patients are at increased risk of death, but their risk may not manifest for years when they have a recurrence, for example, that would not have happened, would have been averted if they'd had immediate cancer treatment. And as our group has met to prepare, we've identified countless questions like this that are similar. Now, of course, patients facing such risks, life-threatening risks, are the minority of those who currently receive abortion care. And most patients will not qualify for abortion under Michigan's law and will really have only three options. They can leave the state for care, they can self-manage abortion, or they can give birth. So all three are a big deal for patients and pregnant people and have enormous impact on health systems, including primary care and subspecialist care across pediatric settings, and as well as it infects insurers and medical education programs. I'm gonna to get to this slide in just a second, but the other thing I wanna say is that since more than half of the medical workforce can become pregnant, healthcare is disproportionately provided by people with the uterus, by women, health systems, human resources will also be affected. affected. Okay, the first thing I wanna talk about now, and this is what this slide speak to, speaks to, is out-of-state care. People with the necessary resources and support will leave the state for care. This map, so Michigan is shaped like a mitten. You can see um, this is Michigan over here. This is what we do when we're trying to say what Michigan looks like. Ann Arbor, where I am, is right here. Um, we are an orange state, just like Utah. And, but we're surrounded by water, international borders, and that's about it. You guys at least have some states with abortion care on two of your borders. So leaving the state is something that may be possible. And in fact, the Guttmacher Institute has estimated that in Michigan, the average distance to travel for abortion will go from about 11 miles one way to 251 miles one way, or a more than 2,000% increase. Now, of course, these are just averages. So people who live in urban or suburban settings may have less distance and people who live up here in the upper peninsula or in what we call the thumb of Michigan may have longer distances to go. For most people, travel to Illinois is what is going to make the most sense and a lot of our contingency planning is around that. What I do wanna say though, is that the Guttmacher Institute also tells us that abortion is increasingly concentrated among poor women half live below the federal poverty level and another quarter live below one to two times the federal poverty level. So traveling distances like I showed you is going to be difficult for many people. As you may know, most people seeking an abortion are already parents. So travel will also be complicated by childcare needs and many can't afford to lose wages or will be fired if they take time away from work. Nevertheless, I'm gonna go back just a slide. Um, I just wanted to show you some national data on distance traveled. So we talked about Michigan, but this is what things would look like for the whole country. And a lot of the data I'll show you today are from uh, economist Caitlin Myers, who works on the impact of abortion restrictions. And these are her data. The darker colors mean a greater distance to abortion care. So you can see there's a lot of dark blue here in Michigan. Utah is similar. Texas, similar. Those are some of the regions that are gonna be 
where patients will face the biggest burden in the, the wake of a ban. But in, in the post-row modeling here, and this model didn't include Wisconsin, there's some debate about what will happen with Wisconsin, but in subsequent modeling, Caitlin Myers has actually assumed Wisconsin will not have abortion care available. Um, but 41% of US women would experience an increase in travel distance under an abortion ban if Roe is overturned from a nationwide average of 35 miles now to 279 miles. So those numbers are uh, a little bit similar to, to those in Michigan. Many people, um, just under half, will have nearly 300 miles to travel. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, they're often doing it without many resources. Despite that, health systems in states where abortion is legal, or sorry, is illegal, will still have vital roles to play even when they can't provide abortion care themselves. Clinicians in those states should, they may not be allowed to, the law is unclear, but they should offer referrals or pre-travel teeing up to patients who may leave the state. And this may include things like an ultrasound ahead of time so that someone knows precisely how far in the pregnancy they are, or blood work to make sure that they're not too anemic to have an abortion safely in an outpatient setting. And it may involve fast tracking, so to speak, um, care with subspecialists to ensure that patients with underlying illnesses can safely receive care once they get to an out-of-state facility. You could imagine if someone travels 250 miles and they get there and find out that they have a hemoglobin that's too low to safely have a pregnancy in an outpatient setting, it would have been good for them to know that information ahead of time. Insurers uh, are going to need to decide whether to cover out-of-state abortion care and associated travel expenses and hospital systems will need to determine whether neighboring states will have capacity to see their patients who require hospital level care, generally patients with underlying medical illnesses, and will also need to develop plans for transferring patients who are already hospitalized across state lines for care if we can't provide that care in state. The second option, other than tra besides traveling for care, is self-managed or self-sourced or mail order medication abortion. We now have over 20 years experience showing that pregnant patients can safely have an abortion at home or after receiving Food and Drug Administration, FDA approved medications, the regimen of mifepristone and mesoprostol in a medical office. So that's been an FDA approved regimen again for over 20 years. And we now have increasing evidence from around the world that shows that self-sourced mifepristone and mesoprostol, or some people say mesoprostol, or self-sourced mesoprostol alone are safe and effective as well. These are just some websites and uh, points where people may be able to access medications on their own. Aid Access and Plan C both are able to provide medications or help advise where people can get medications. QR their codes. QR codes are there for your interest. I want to show you a little bit of data from Texas. This was in the New York Times a number of weeks ago. So Texas essentially has a ban after five to six weeks of gestation or three to five, three to four weeks from um, conception. And in the dark purple, you see these are the number of abortions that were provided legally in state prior to the ban. And you can see that goes down substantially after the ban. In this middle purple color, you see requests for abortion pills. This is online requests, so self, people self-sourcing abortion pills. And this light purple line is people seeking legal abortion in neighboring or nearby states. So you can see that one of the biggest changes is that many people are leaving the state for abortion care. There also appears to be uh, a somewhat increased use of a request for abortion pills and much less abortion in the state. So self-source abortion seems to be something that people will do. Patients without access to these medications though, and those say, you know, who, who don't have internet access or a credit card or no private way to receive mail or who simply don't know about it might use methods that are ineffective or even worse, dangerous. And these may include, you know, inserting things, implements, objects into the cervix or vagina. This is the proverbial coat hanger. Or they may use caustic substances or put in their vagina or ingest poisons or toxins or intentionally subject themselves to trauma. 
And in those cases, there's real risk of harm to people. And this slide is, um, if I could only have one slide that talks about the impact of legal versus legal abortion on people's lives, it would be this slide. So it's really busy. I'm gonna take a moment to take you through it. Um, this is what happened in Romania when abortion was made illegal and then legalized under the Ceausescu regime, which was a, a pronatalist dictator regime, basically. So over here is when abortion became illegal. Here is when um, it was legalized. This blue shaded area is the fertility rate. It's basically the number of children that people were having. This blue line represents maternal mortality. And this blue line represents maternal mortality from unsafe abortion. So this line is a combination of maternal mortality from birth and unsafe abortion. And basically what you see is that when abortion is banned, there's an initial increase in birth rate, but over a number of years, it goes back down to roughly where it was before. And the main thing that happens is maternal mortality goes up and most of that maternal mortality is due to unsafe abortion. This yellow line is maternal mortality from obstetrical causes, which actually went down through this time, even as overall maternal mortality kept rising. So this is the fear, of course, that people will use unsafe methods and they will die in the course of that. That's what this red line rising is. My hope is that this is not what's going to happen, that care providers out of compassion and conscience will help steer people towards things like mifepristone and mesoprostol or mesoprostol alone, relatively safe methods, but some states may not allow that, it's ambiguous, um, but nevertheless, health systems need to think about what something, what a harm reduction approach in their context would look like. Does that, for example, mean opening a lot of outpatient or emergency department off, uh, manual vacuum aspiration or office uterine evacuation clinics to rapidly care for people who may have used something to end a pregnancy and need uh, assistance to safely complete that process? Um, we can talk more about harm reduction and what that would look like later if we have time. Healthcare providers in emergency department settings are going to need to become very familiar with the normal course of self-managed abortion with medications, as well as its rare complications and the complications of unsafe methods. We're trying to avoid this red line, basically. Because medication-induced abortion is so safe, though, many patients who seek follow-up care will really just require confirmation that their abortion is complete or they may need a brief outpatient intervention if it's incomplete. Now, ensuring abortion is complete is also important because mesoprostol can be associated with fetal birth defects, though it's rare. Patients who, need, who use unsafe methods, on the other hand, may require life-saving critical care for sepsis, hemorrhage, pelvic organ injury, or exposure to toxic substances. And so it's this weird bifurcated experience where clinicians are rarely actually going to need to intervene most of the time if people are using mesoprostol and mifepristone. And at the same time, they need to be ready for aggressive critical care treatment if patients use dangerous methods. I do want to say, though, that because mifepristone and mesoprostol are safe, the legal risks for patients may be the bigger ones, the threat of reporting, arrest, and detention. Any pregnant patient who has bleeding in pregnancy or has pregnancy loss may be vulnerable to reporting and criminal prosecution, whether they actually took measures to end their pregnancy or not, but they may be having a spontaneous miscarriage. It's really virtually impossible to tell the difference between a medication-induced abortion and a, a miscarriage. And data show, though, that healthcare providers are more likely to report pregnant patients to the authorities when those patients are Black or live on low incomes. Hospitals are going to need clear policies for all staff regarding this risk and regarding medical record documentation in this new climate. And just to be clear, no state currently requires reporting of suspected self-managed abortion, but we may be in a new era of don't ask, don't tell. We may not want to know if people knew they were pregnant or how many pregnancies they've had. And this may impact our documentation, our electronic medical record templates. Um, and so this is gonna be life in a new climate. Finally, the last thing I wanna talk about is birth. People who can't travel for care or self-manage abortion are going to give birth. These are data, again, from Caitlin Myers, the economist I mentioned earlier, and she actually updated these over the weekend. Um, so now her estimate is that 76% of women 
who currently live somewhere where abortion would be banned will find a way to reach a healthcare provider to end their pregnancy. And 24, the new estimate is 24% of those patients will not. And her estimate is that 75% of that 23% that does not travel will give birth. So bottom line, doing all the math is that about 18% of patients who would have ended a pregnancy will give birth. And that's the lowest estimate. I saw another estimate recently at a national meeting that suggested no, two thirds of patients are not going to get to a provider and 85% of those are going to give birth, meaning 57% of women in counties where they lose access or where travel distances increase will give birth. And in my state, in Michigan, this translates to about an eight to 17% increase in births in Michigan. And we already have maternity care deserts. So requiring labor and delivery units to work over capacity will affect all birthing people, not just the ones who wanted to end a pregnancy. And obviously it would affect newborn care as well and neonatal ICUs and later pediatricians, there'll be more babies and more children. And some may have substantial medical needs in infancy and beyond particularly in cases where parents may have ended a pregnancy in the wake of a fetal anatomical or genetic diagnosis. So it's not at all clear that the social safety and medical safety nets that we need for families of children with disabilities or complex medical needs, it's not clear those will expand as the need for them does. The other issue I wanna mention is maternal mortality. Maternal mortality will increase because abortion is safer than childbirth. So the CDC tells us that the risk of dying in the setting of childbirth is 50 to 130 times greater than dying in the setting of abortion. And because of that, demographers estimate that maternal mortality will increase 21% under a ban. So this is this number here. We're looking at um, the additional deaths under a ban, and this is by category of people, and I'm looking at this bottom line. All people, on average, will experience a 21% increase in maternal mortality. But Echoing existing disparities, that risk is estimated to be 13% in white birthing people and 33% in black birthing women. That's pretty horrifying. And there are a lot of systemic inequities and racism that lead to those underlying disparities in maternal mortality, and they're going to be exacerbated when more people are giving birth. So there's sort of layers and layers of inequity. The other thing I should say about these numbers is they don't account for maternal mortality increases from unsafe abortion. In, in this modeling, Amanda Stevenson, who's the author here, assumed that all self-managed abortion is safe and no one dies from it. So that may not be the case and maternal mortality may be even higher than what is reflected here. The other thing that people need to talk about is perinatal mental health needs of pregnant patients who are continuing undesired pregnancies, including those that result from sexual assault. Those needs would undoubtedly intensify as well, further stressing an overtaxed mental health care system. And I do want to mention that the implications of an abortion ban extend beyond the things I mentioned to other dimensions of reproductive health care. For example, doctors may hesitate to treat patients with an ectopic pregnancy or inevitable miscarriage or pre-viability rupture of membranes when fetal cardiac activity remains. Hospital pharmacies, doctors, midwives, and advanced practice clinicians may need to consider whether they're going to continue and stock the best evidence-based medication treatment for spontaneous abortion, which is mifepristone and misoprostol, the same medications used in abortion care. They're, they may be scared that using those medications, even for miscarriage, could bring accusations of criminal activity. And infertility care practices may need to halt provision of selective reduction for multifetal pregnancies that sometimes results from the medications people get for IVF or in vitro fertilization. And without multifetal Pregnancy reduction, for example, loss of entire pregnancies may ensue, and as well as premature delivery and concomitant uh, neonatal morbidity and mortality. Maternal complications are likely as well. There may be IVF practitioners who decline to provide treatment at all, given the potential for embryo destruction in IVF. And of course, Healthcare providers everywhere are also going to need to ensure ready access to all forms of contraception without access barriers. 
The overturn of Roe will also affect medical education. Abortion training opportunities are required for accreditation of OBGYN residency and complex family planning training programs. They're an integral part of some nursing, midwifery, advanced practice clinician, family medicine, maternal fetal medicine, and gynecologic oncology training. Programs will need to consider out of state out of state training with all the accompanying licensure and logistical issues that that brings. And patients will likely feel the downstream effects of this if abortion training is no longer possible. Trainees can't perform quote unquote non-life-saving abortion care. Within a generation, there probably will be no one left to provide that life-saving abortion care. And routine care like miscarriage management will also be affected because one of the best predictors of a physician offering the full range of miscarriage management options is that they had abortion care training as a resident. And finally, our health systems are disproportionately manned, so to speak, by women, including nurses, medical assistants, administrative assistants, inpatient unit clerks, phlebotomists, phlebotomists x-ray technicians, and more, as well as, of course, physicians. And it's really not clear how smoothly health systems will function when a larger fraction of the workforce is pregnant, on parental leave, or traveling for abortion care. So I've been going around to different departments and when I talk about all this, they often just, it's like I threw a grenade into the room. People weren't thinking on this level. Abortion is so polarized and so politicized that most people, even in healthcare systems, think of it just as a political issue and not a healthcare issue. And hearing this for the first time may be overwhelming. So if that's how you're feeling, I just wanna name and normalize that feeling. Yes, abortion is an issue of rights and women's status and freedom to choose one's reproductive and life destiny. And apparently that's an issue up for political debate. But it is also it, an issue of health and healthcare and health equity. And it can feel overwhelming to think about all of the ways that healthcare systems may be affected by the criminalization of abortion. I have just a few minutes remaining and I want to touch on a few things which I'm happy to revisit when we get to the question and answer period. One, I wanna talk about wider university life. So this is an intentionally busy slide. It is meant to create a feeling of overwhelm. I'm part of a university community like you and non-clinical things will be affected. We are trying to get ready for immediate needs for students. You know, what will happen after that first welcome week of school, that first week of classes and someone takes a pregnancy test and it's positive and they're now, they've just moved to a state where there is no abortion care. How do we help them? How do we get um, resources to RAs, residential advisors, into housing? How do we make sure contraception access is adequate? How do we get mental health resources to people who are continuing pregnancies they don't want to, and in particularly in the setting of sexual assault? Michigan's law does not allow for abortion in the setting of sexual assault. There are many legal questions. Students need to know what kind of digital privacy they have. We need to know that campus police aren't going to arrest people who have medications delivered to their university mailboxes. We don't want students or RAs reporting students to the authorities if they think they've ended a pregnancy. There are also financial and academic policies. Can institutions use an emergency funds to help support patients to seek abortion care out of state? What happens to time away from school? What about student health insurance? Will it cover out of state care? I mean, the list goes on and on. There are faculty issues like delays in getting work done for promotion and tenure because potentially more pregnancies um, or travel away. This will affect who's able to come to university and complete university. One of the best predictors of um, finishing a post-secondary degree is the ability to get an abortion that you seek uh, when you request one. It's, people are about twice as likely to complete a post-secondary degree when they get the abortion they seek than when they don't. There are issues about what we can continue to teach in our curriculum. And of course, there are huge research needs in this as well. We need to document all of the experiences that are happening. Longer term, are people gonna wanna continue to come to school and work in a state where uh, abortion care is not available? I wanna spend just the a last couple minutes talking about something that I don't think many people realize about Roe versus Wade. And then I'll, I'll end. And again, I'll look forward to taking questions later. So obviously Roe was the decision that defined the right to not be pregnant. However, it was also the first articulation of the rights that a person has, a woman has, while pregnant, meaning it defines the rights of people who continue their pregnancy as well as those who end it. So what do I mean by that? Well, 
When the Supreme Court said in Roe that fetuses are not constitutional persons at any stage of development, which is what Roe said, that's why abortion was permissible, it in effect established the personhood of women during all stages of pregnancy. Roe made clear that even after fetal viability, the state's obligation to respect and protect a pregnant woman's life and health outweighs the state interest in potential fetal life. In Roe, the court said that the state must allow post-viability abortions necessary to safeguard the health of a pregnant woman. That's what I mentioned earlier is the health exception. So what Roe is basically saying is that state interest in the fetus is never greater than its interest in the health and liberty of the woman who carries it. Fetal protection is okay, but it can never be advanced in a way that deprives pregnant women of their constitutional liberties, i.e. women, retain their full constitutional rights to liberty and bodily autonomy while pregnant. So Roe began to articulate that and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which followed it, further articulated it. Women, pregnant people do not lose their constitutional rights. They are still constitutional people even when they become pregnant. So if the court overturns Roe, and this is really scary, a state will basically be free to advance fetal protections in whatever ways it wants. There are no limits on it. And that could include ways that deprive pregnant women of basic rights to liberty and bodily autonomy. Undoing Roe really in effect gives pregnant women second class status and they would no longer be full constitutional people, persons. So this is my sad prediction in the event that Roe is indeed overturned is that anyone who becomes pregnant will become newly vulnerable to legal surveillance, civil detentions, forced interventions, and criminal prosecution. And we will see a wave of arrests and prosecutions of pregnant people, mm, excuse me, not just when women end a pregnancy, but when they continue a pregnancy as well. I'm going to pause there. The bottom line is that I don't know if everybody knows what is about to pass. This is a health and healthcare issue in addition to being an issue about rights and what women and people who can become pregnant can expect from the state from their government and the impact beyond abortion of the loss of Roe uh, remains to be seen and is likely quite significant. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to seeing you shortly and I'm uh, happy to take questions at that time. Thank you very much. As promised, uh, that was a superb talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Harris. There are very few people, uh, I think, who could make the transition after that kind of talk um, and would bring the gravitas to it um, to leave you equally or more awed. And such a person is in the room. So we are delighted to welcome uh, Katie Watson, an associate professor at North Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine, where she's an award-winning teacher of medical ethics, medical humanities, and constitutional law. Her articles on abortion ethics and practice have appeared in public publications, including New England Journal, JAMA, Lancet, and The New Yorker. And she is the author of the Scarlet, or Scarlet A, The Ethics, Law, and Politics of Ordinary Abortion, which was published in 2018. Um, the same year when I advocated, uh, after having read the book, um, which I believe to be the best modern writing in book form about abortion, um, if you have not read it, please do yourself a favor, get a copy, read it. We have several in, in the family planning division. Just come on by. I'm happy to share. But uh, I was so impressed. Oh, God, I forgot to take off my mask. Um, after I had uh, read the book that um, I went on a personal crusade uh, so that every complex family planning fellow entering uh, the fellowship that next year was uh, and the, the current fellows at the time were presented with a copy um, through the National Office um, of the Family Planning Fellowship. Um, it's that good. And it really has become a, a touchstone, I think, for all people involved uh, in abortion care in the United States and beyond. Um, so uh, Dr. Watson's uh, Work has also been described as revolutionary by the New York Times and received not so, it wasn't just me who appreciated this, lots of other people as well 
Um, and the book received the George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contribution to Honesty and Clarity in Public Language. And that is like a beautiful summary of so much of Katie Watson's work. Um, Professor Watson is uh, also a member of the Northwestern Memorial Hospital Ethics Committee, the Ethics Committee for the International Federation of, Obstetric, of Gynecology and Obstetrics. Um, she's a member of the editorial board of the AMA Journal of Ethics, uh, the board of the National Abortion Federation, Planned Parenthood National Medical Council, and she's a former board member of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. Um, you are in for an, uh, another treat and then following uh, a discussion. So thank you so very much, Professor Watson, for coming and joining us in person here in Salt Lake City and uh, very much looking forward to your comments. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be here. I was here in 2017, I believe, and I developed such great fondness for your community that when Dave said, do you want to get on a plane? I said, yes. Um, it seemed like a really good idea at the time. Um, so to advance, I do this. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. So let me jump in um, straight to the chase here. I want to say, I, um, and it's so nice to be able to build on Dr. Harris's talk. I come with three observations. My talk is premised on these three observations. The first is temporal. Um, we are in an extraordinary historic moment um, where we don't know exactly what's to come, but the fact that Justice Alito wrote that draft opinion means he feels very confident he has five votes to overturn Roe. And so whether it's tweaked, I think we can for the moment, proceed on the um, understanding that it will be overturned. I can't believe that uh, at some level. And I I was also on a plane home from the same meeting Dr. Harris was at when my phone uh, told me the news um, when I landed. And to me, it felt like when my father had a terminal cancer diagnosis. When he died, I wasn't surprised, but I was still shocked. And I was still so devastated, though I knew it would happen. And so I think the only silver lining, and boy, is it a thin one, of this leak is that we can grieve and experience the emotion now for those of us who are shocked but not surprised, or as Dr. Harris mentioned, all the people who are like, what? That was possible? It is. Um, and so when it, when it comes down for real, we are all action. Um, but this is our time to be together. So I am so glad to be here with you. Um, the second observation is spatial. I am from this blue state, Illinois. We are already the number one state in the country for out-of-state abortion patients, almost 20%, um, because we are in that um, uh, the donut hole. And you are in a state that has a trigger ban. And I want to be very respectful of our how differently we are situated. And I'm so eager to learn from you um, and to acknowledge both how we are differently situated, how this will affect clinicians differently who we work with, those of us who are not clinicians, and how we can partner to support each other during what I hope is a transitional time until all people's rights are restored. And then the third is philosophical. Um, I want to make the observation, this is one of my favorite pieces of political art, and how just the addition of an apostrophe can change immoral to I'm moral. And it um, is striking to me the image, clearly someone else had to write that on her back. So pregnant people suffer just such judgment. Um, and it's hard for to self-define um, or to be permitted to self-define in the current culture. And so I want to be respectful that there's a range of, of feelings or opinions about abortion in this audience. I just assume that to be true. And um, that's fine with me. I speak to you today from the vantage point of a clinical ethicist. And so my job is to respect patient perspectives and defend patient options for what they believe is best for their life. And so that is the vantage point from which I'm going to speak today. And I'm gonna ask, invite you to think about these questions. What would happen if we focused on equity, inclusion, and conscience more? And I won't say on embryos less because to take this lens, 
does not exclude consideration of embryos and fetuses, but it shifts the focus to patient conscience and as to who should make that evaluation and answers it, the pregnant person. So in this talk, I am presuming, and I'll talk more about conscience, that pregnant people have made those evaluations. And as healthcare providers and led people who are legislators and public health advocates should be thinking less about that and more about population effects for the pregnant people themselves. Um, some of this talk is from an article that will be published, um, I think within a month in the American Journal of Bioethics. So I just wanted to flag that for you. Um, so first, uh, to thinking about equity. My article investigates, why don't we talk about abortion care as a healthcare disparities issue? Um, so some of this audience are familiar with uh, 1948, the classic WHO definition of health is a state of complete and physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, this is one of my favorite definitions of health disparities. Um, inequalities is the term they use in the UK. Health differences that are avoidable, unnecessary, and unjust. To me, like there's lots of long definitions. I just like that one as a succinct one. Um, in 2010, this is the first definition by the U.S. federal government for the Healthy People 2020 plan of what healthcare disparities are. And I flagged some of the issues I'm going to talk about, but linked to social economic disadvantage, racial or ethnic groups, socioeconomic status, gender. So I think we have quite a bit of agreement on you know, there are different definitions, nuanced applications, but, but the concept of health disparities and in the wake of the um, murder of George Floyd and the racial reckoning, my field of bioethics has recommitted to acknowledging that the principle of justice and principalism is not just about rationing ventilators. It is also about social justice and a deeper embrace of the concept that allowing or enduring he remediable health disparities is an act of injustice. It is unethical to continue to not work to ameliorate those disparities. So I offer you this. Um, as Dr. Harris pointed out, 75% of all abortion patients are either below the poverty line or in that 100 to 200% low income. And currently the federal poverty line for a single person is about $13,000. So that is not a lot of money. And 59% of patients are people of color um, compared to 38% in the U.S. population. It is Black and Hispanic women who are disproportionately represented in these numbers. Why is that? Um, well, one of the primary drivers, though not exclusive, but primary, is that the, the tragic overrepresentation of Black and Hispanic women among poor women. Um, they're more likely disproportionately to be poor. So that is one of the large reasons you see that overlap. But why are poor women overrepresented among abortion patients? Well, uh, one significant reason is that they have five times more unintended pregnancies than women with two hundred incomes over 200%. And again, the 200% is about $26,000. Um, so it's just a radical difference. Here's when you break it down, um, 112 unintended pregnancies per thousand versus 20. Framed as a percentage, 60% of pregnancies are unintended in women with incomes below the poverty line. Women in that 200 plus category, it's 30%. I'm in that category, so I'll use the pronoun we. I would say we are not nailing it either. Um, and I think many people just aren't aware of the rate of unintended pregnancy in the United States. Um, Dr. Harris shared this slide about abortion being increasingly concentrated among poor women. Absolutely true, critically important to this disparities analysis. However, what is rarely mentioned is higher income women terminate more of their unintended pregnancies. So higher income women, 200 plus, terminate 48% of their unintended pregnancies. And of those, um, I have them circled, um, at 100% or less of the federal poverty line, 38% of their unintended pregnancies, uh, they choose to terminate. Now I say choose to, is that a difference in values? Or is that a difference in access to abortion care? So a healthcare disparities lens would look at access, equitable access 
to treatment for the underlying health condition. We both want to prevent diabetes and treat diabetes, prevent hypertension and treat hypertension. And we rarely frame this so explicitly that abortion is treatment for an unwanted pregnancy, right? So when we just use this public health lens, we can start to adapt those frameworks. So why don't we talk about abortion care as a health disparities issue? I will posit abortion exceptionalism. The feeling or idea that absolutely everything about abortion is different than every other medical issue or every other social issue. And of course, abortion is unique in the same way that every area of medical care, whether it's organ transplant or pediatrics, has its own specialty specific ethics issues and aspects and nuances, but there is also overlap among medical specialties in ethical issues, right? And I think that abortion exceptionalism has prevented us and our focus on um, embryos and fetuses, moral status, and the conscience of clinicians being the two dominant topics in the ethics literature has blinded us to the ways in which abortion care is similar to other treatments uh, and other issues uh, in medicine and society um, and has put the blinders on that um, have prevented us from thinking about abortion care through this health disparities lens. And I find it because, and I didn't even mention the obvious fact, um, everyone who seeks an abortion has a uterus and the vast majority of those identify as women. So we have the gender aspect, the race aspect, the economic aspect, and I won't even go into the, the geographic aspect of rural versus urban access, the travel distances. It just fits so perfectly. So when you don't see it written about in that way, you know something's happening, right? And so I just invite this audience to think about this. And is this a way? because it is an accepted framework to talk about abortion in states where the topic is extraordinarily stigmatized? Does this give us a new way or an additional way to talk about um, the need for abortion access? Um, I call this the ethics of access, right? It moves us from the ethics of the act of abortion to the ethics of who actually gets to the doctor and who gets to call themselves a patient. Um, the traditional medical ethics and the principalism assumes a patient who's already in the room and then analyzes what happens in that two-person encounter versus considering all the people who never made it into the door. So there's this merge between public health imperatives and um, bioethics and clinical ethics imperatives that I think happens when we think about the ethics of access. And we could apply this framework I'm suggesting to all sorts of other medical care as well. Number two, to move to inclusion. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about reproductive justice and we can't really do too much hand raising here because um, folks are on Zoom. I'll just ask the, pe the people in the room are the family planning faculty, so it's kind of, kind of fixed. I'm guessing they're pretty well acquainted with this concept. But um, when I was in law school, I had a fellowship in reproductive freedom. And that's, that's what the framework I was taught. That's the framework I knew. And later, women of color showed me what happens when you expand your vision and you expand your ambition to justice rather than simply freedom. When you add justice and you add inclusion and you add equity, how much more robust the framework becomes. And so for me, in principalism, again, uh, justice is often called the, the forgotten or the neglected principle. Um, reproductive justice to me is a way to reinvigorate principalism in medical ethics and in reproductive care. So very briefly, and, and reproductive justice is different than a health disparities analysis, though it, it, sent, it doesn't compare people of color to white people. It centers marginalized and historically minoritized groups, centers their needs, which is different than saying everyone should get the same thing. Um, so I just want to briefly offer this overview. Reproductive freedom is a, a negative right, and that's our constitutional system of negative rights, to be left alone, and it really just focuses on the right to not have children. And I am all for reproductive freedom. Like, this is not a rejection of it. It's an essential piece of what it is I think many of us seek. So let me remind you how it came about. Um, 
The contraception cases uh, happened in 65 and 1972. And many of my students are just so shocked to think states banned contraception um, as recently as this. And it's so terrifying to hear a Southern governor saying, maybe we'll look at that again. Um, so I think it's important to revisit our history. Um, this is the bumper sticker quote from Eisenstadt. If the right of privacy means anything, it's the right to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusion into matters as fundament, so fundamentally affecting a person as the decision whether to bear or beget a child. Now in Roe, one year later, the question was, does the presence of an embryo or a fetus change the answer to this? And the answer was no. Um, and part of it was, I think the court's humility. Uh, I wish they'd use capital L in the word life there, but we need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. The court says, we don't know. That will be up to the pregnant person, essentially. And in a pluralistic society, you know, when people say, we've been fighting about abortion for almost 50 years, that doesn't trouble me. That's like saying, we've been a country for over 250 years and we haven't picked the best religion. Like, oh, okay. That's, that wasn't the goal, actually. It was to live in a pluralistic society where we could make different choices. And I think the Roe Court is very much drawing on that. In Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the, the concept of the freedom of conscience comes through even stronger. And so this quote from the um, plurality's opinion really does suddenly use the word conscience, profound moral and spiritual implications. Um, however, our obligation is to define the liberty of all, not to mandate our own moral code. And I think that's what's, to me, as a lawyer who focuses on constitutional law, the most offensive thing about the leaked draft opinion is the false neutrality of it. This claim, Justice Kavanaugh made this claim in oral arguments, the idea that the Constitution is neither pro-choice nor pro-life. Um, the idea that abortion, that word is not in the Constitution. Well, neither is contraception or marriage, or a uh, family, or children, like a whole litany of topics on which the court has ruled that people have a constitutional right to their, their fundamental beliefs and their intimate actions. Um, and so the, the draft Dobbs decision actually does mandate a moral code because it talks about the protection of persons and without explicitly saying it allows legislators' morality rather than individual pregnant people's morality to decide what happens. Um, so um, that is troubling. Um, so now to shift, so that's the negative rights, reproductive freedom. To shift to positive rights, in 94, um, the, the concept of reproductive justice was developed. In 97, this wonderful group, Sister Song, was established and partly premised on the observation that the negative right to be left alone was um, a focus on white middle class or upper class women because my right to actually have a child or to parent the child I have with dignity and safety hadn't historically been challenged. My The pronatalist uh, influence for, to want me to have babies <laughs> hadn't been challenged. And so that the reproductive freedom concept was incomplete. So the reproductive justice model includes those rights to both the right to not have children and to have children and then to go on and parent your children. I love that 20 years later, they added sexual autonomy and gender freedom because what was all that contraception for? Right? Like most, most sexual encounters, the intent is not to conceive a child um, between um, heterosexual partners. Um, and, and it's so refreshing to name sexual pleasure and sexual expression and sexual communication and romantic relationships as, as a critical human right. Um, the co Supreme Court, the contraception cases, the abortion cases never engage with that concept. Um, and if this is a positive right to be assisted, so it's more of a human rights framework, and it centers, again, marginalized people experiencing the idea that if you center those populations and their needs and experiences every and create policies that work for them, probably everyone else will be taken care of. Whereas if you just center wealthy white women, that is not true in terms of the ripple effect. So... Um, I would call this the first R.J. book, although it doesn't use the term reproductive justice. 
And the brilliant uh, legal scholar, uh, Dorothy Roberts, arguing if you don't understand the reproductive experience of enslaved women and the historical trauma that has left in terms of forced reproduction, being separated from one's children, reproduction as an economic engine, you don't understand what reproductive rights or freedom or justice is in the black community. Um, and then 20 years later, uh, the reproductive justice movement, of course, being a community driven um, movement, an organizer driven, an activist driven movement. I love the iterative process of this book 20 years after Dorothy Roberts' book being written by the head of Sister Song and a PhD historian, and the term suddenly really taking off in academic circles. And I really love the ground up. It's sort of many of you know the history of medication abortion of Brazilian women using uh, the drug off label saying, oh, it's for ulcers. A terrible side effect is it ends pregnancy? You don't say, you know, and figuring that out and, and doing this basically this natural experiment in using those dr that drug. And, and here we have this, this um, upward bubbling iterative effect. So what happens when we use the RJ framework to expand our gaze? And I use the, the term our advisedly because there are people in the center who are like, yeah, I, that was always my gaze. Um, but I, I want to own it to expand my gaze. The right to have children becomes so important. Many in this audience, I think, are probably aware of the history of coerced sterilization in the United States. This is the famous and awful Buck versus Bell Supreme Court precedent, which has never been overruled, I think would be repudiated today. But when we talk about a right to have children, there's very little constitutional law about the right to have children. It's all contraception and abortion law about the right to not have children, um, which and the Supreme Court case said it was constitutional for the state to have these sterilization programs. Um, we know his, now, looking on uh, historically, that, um, that Carrie Buck and Emma Buck and, and Carrie's baby likely had no cognitive impairment. That was the claim for the basis of their sterilization. Um, Carrie had been raped uh, when she was a domestic servant uh, in a rich person's house. Um, she was there because her mother couldn't afford to care for her and they were hiding the pregnancy. So it has always been about um, class and, and, and um, exploitation of women. Um, it's not just ancient history. Um, there's a wonderful documentary, if you haven't seen it, called No Mas Babes. Babies um, about the forced or coerced or un, um, unconsented sterilization of women in California at academic medical centers, Mexican American women, um, where residents doing practicing hysterectomies or excuse me, practicing tubal ligations, and um, just clinicians making an assessment: this person's had too many babies; it's time to stop. Um, and then there was a more recent report in the late '90s and early 2000s of women in California prisons being coerced into sterilization. So this is not just ancient history, and it helps from an art, if you understand the RJ perspective, helps you see this differently. When this is for um, I, implants, um, in 2017, in the South Dakota Medicaid manual, you, you can't get them out. Medicaid will pay to put them in, but they won't pay to take them out if the intent is for the recipient to become pregnant. What would be the number one indication for removing um, a long acting contraception, right? It would be, I'd like to have a baby now. Um, so the, the reproductive control of poor women is not just in the, the I don't want to have a baby. It's the, I want to have a baby. Thankfully, um, this was removed in 2018 after people went bananas appropriately, but the, the, the understanding of this or the depth of this changes when you understand that the U.S. Indian Health Service sterilized approximately 25% of Native American women in the 70s, and this is happening in South Dakota, right, with a high population of Native women. So it deepens our gaze, I think. I get this a version of this case maybe once a year um, where someone doesn't want to um, take an IUD out for a low-income patient. and Often it is analyzed uh, as autonomy versus justice. And the idea is that it's the autonomy of the patient versus a sort of a resource allocation issue, that there are only so many IUDs in these clinics designed for low-income women. But when you take a reproductive justice analysis, you say, would a white woman with private insurance ever 
wait for 10 seconds to have her IUD removed because she says I'm getting married and I don't want it. So what is this pushback about? Um, what is this entitlement to control someone else's contraceptive use about? And why isn't it perfectly rational for poor women and women of color to be nervous about LARCs um, when they are dependent on doctors agreeing with them about when it's time to take them out? Um, let's turn briefly to the right to parent about in terms of expanding our gaze. Um, not as many people uh, were not taught the, the history of indigenous boarding schools and the idea of the destruction of culture and the separation of children from their parents um, in the United States. Um, again, Dorothy Roberts crushing it. In 2002, she wrote about the foster care system, and now she has a new book examining, again, the elephant of the room of why are such a vastly disproportionate amount of children in the foster care system, African-American, um, their families being punished for the crime of poverty, the children's experience becoming worse in foster care in many cases, um, disproportionate to white children living in poverty or parents who are um, arguably needing support, um, that this is still the extension of the um, racist regulatory control of black families. Um, many of you in the medical field are aware of the um, discriminatory drug screening um, that goes on that can lead to the separation of black families. Um, and in the, um, I, I was very moved by this Time Magazine cover. Um, this um, artist, Titus Kafar, has a, Macar um, a TED talk that is like, one of the best 15 minutes you'll spend this week. Um, he, uh, about um, the absence of African-American people in classic art, um, he painted an African-American mother and then, and then child and then cut out the child. Because to him, um, the fact that George Floyd was calling out for his deceased mother brought to him the idea of family and all the Black lives lost, all the mothers who lose their children to police violence and mass incarceration. Um, so thinking of that as a reproductive justice issue. And then finally, we don't, I, I want to invite you to consider the possibility that abortion is also a parenting issue. So here, um, the statistics are that 59% of abortion patients already have a child, 33% have two or more. Um, and these patients are extraordinarily clear on what happens with the pregnancy if it's not uninterrupted. They did that. Um, so the idea that they don't know what they're doing is nonsensical. Um, and the idea that they may need to do have an abortion or they may have chosen to have an abortion in order to facilitate their parenting is rich to me. Um, a colleague and I did I analyze the notebooks that an abortion clinic left out for patients to just spontaneously write in whatever they would like to write. Um, and we were struck by the fact 50% of these entries over, I think it's nine years, um, use what we call maternal reasoning. They offer that the reason for their abortion is either the protection of existing children, the desire to protect future children so they can be the kind of mother they want to be or give that future child the life that they think it deserves, or protection of the embryo or fetus they are carrying, thinking though it doesn't have a medical diagnosis, this is not a life worth living or a life they want to bring it into, and it will be better off after through the abortion rather from birth. And this is just one example of someone I would say fits that it, that framework of um, abortion as a defense of the right to parent or the need to parent. Um, now let's go back to the right to not have children. Um, the RJ framework also deepens our gaze. I think it takes all those freedom of conscience, what I call the freedom of conscience uh, cases in terms of contraception and abortion, um, and talks about, well, who can't get to the doctor? And it makes me think of the ethics of the Hyde Amendment, the federal um, um, amendment, it's a writer, um, that says the federal Medicaid program will not pay for any abortion care except in the most extraordinarily limited circumstances. And thinking about the ethics of access. So you have a right to abortion, but only if you can pay for it in the United States. Um, and so the Hyde Amendment unethically robs women of their autonomy based on income 
And it allows strangers to do with economic coercion what they couldn't do with persuasion. And to me, that is so deeply un-American. Um, and it works. Um, there's a new study by Sarah Roberts and colleagues in Louisiana where they went to prenatal clinics and asked prenatal patients what their insurance was. And of those who used Medicaid, um, did you consider having an abortion? And was the f lack of money the, the main reason why not? And they concluded that every year, 3,000 Louisiana women on med who use Medicaid for insurance give birth instead of having the abortion they wanted. So this is when I talk about we are moving to a patchwork system of free states and forced motherhood states, I want to acknowledge that the Hyde Amendment and its state copycats already lead to that forced childbearing for poor women in many cases. And we just don't, the, in family planning circles, we acknowledge that. But in the larger American conversation, we don't acknowledge that as much as I think we should. So I've talked about equity and I've talked about inclusion. Um, I want to end by talking about conscience. Now, this is going to sound so dumb, but here's my observation. In this photograph, I think there are two brains in the room and two hearts in the room. Um, but when we talk about conscience, we immediately mean the clinician. And we so rarely acknowledge that there are two consciences in this room um, that I think should both should be honored. Um, the, the, the family planning crowd is intimately familiar with these statistics, but many others aren't. And I think that the significance of prevalence has to do with conscience, that patients are moral agents and they wouldn't be asking you to end their pregnancies unless they thought that was an ethical and morally permissible act, or it was at least, um, ethical enough to choose over childbearing. It doesn't mean they feel awesome about it. It just means they think it's an okay thing to do um, in the grand scheme of things or given their circumstance. Um, and to deny that and defer the, the, the decision-making process to strangers, uh, Dr. Harris talked about the denial of women's personhood, and this is part of it, a long tradition of saying, you know, women in particular or pregnant people in particular can't make good decisions and don't perceive things correctly. Um, so it's a denial of their conscience and their rights of conscience. Um, I interpret the contraception and abortion cases, this is my, my personal shorthand for them, governments can't force women to bear children against their will in service of the moral ideals of strangers. That's what those cases stand for. And that's what is about to be flipped um, in states in particular like Utah. Now, when we talk about conscience, um, this is a relatively recent, five years old, piece um, by Zika Manuel and Ronit Stahl in the New England Journal suggesting there should be no conscientious objection um, option for physicians. That was developed for people drafted into a war. No one made you be a physician. And it's also incompletely followed. If someone, say, is of the Quaker faith and says, I can't go fight, they still get drafted into the army, but they have to work at a desk or in the kitchen and not participate in the fighting. So it's been incompletely, it's a complete opt out um, in most places and nobody drafted you. Now, I think this is too extreme. I'm an ACLU girl who thinks there's um, room for everybody in every profession. However, it's a good reminder to think of conscientious objection for clinicians as a privilege not just a global entitlement, and that it should come with responsibilities, like covering something for someone else when a family planning person stepped in to cover something for you. It's also the case that I'll, I'll direct your attention to the bottom. In my book, I talk about the difference between conscience as a shield, which is I'm protecting myself, versus conscience as a club, that I will use my privilege and my um, opportunity as a clinician to block somebody else's actions or the exercise of their conscience. And conscience has become abused that way as an obstructionist thing that delays or prevents care. Um, ACOG has a, a definition I love because it talks about what conscience is, and it's much broader than state and federal statutes. It's basically the I couldn't sleep at night standard. I wouldn't be who I am if I did X. 
But it also talks about what conscience is not. And that's so important for our learners, that it's not about my my mother-in-law would kill me. My dad would quit paying for medical school. This is uncomfortable or it's icky. That's not conscience. But we're, we live in a clinical world now where people can sneeze the word conscience and be out taken out of service with nothing expected in return. And I think we need to invite people to unpack that and also to make other contributions. So we are centering our patients when we talk about clinician conscience. And so flipping that means centering patient conscience and saying, how can we get this patient's needs met while also respecting clinician conscience, not how can we respect clinician conscience while hopefully meeting this patient's needs? You flip it. Um, It's also recognizing affirmative conscience. This is a wonderful book by Carol Jaffe that talks about pre-row, why would any doctor risk their license and violate the law to provide an abortion if, and she doesn't use this exact terminology, but to apply the ACOG standard, the only reason they would do that is if they couldn't sleep at night unless they did it, right? They wouldn't be who they are unless they did it. If they, to turn away someone in need, someone who could harm themselves, or be forced to have a child they didn't want or couldn't have. Um, so that, that, that's an act of affirmative conscience. And Dr. Harris published an amazing piece um, 10 years ago, uh, talking about affirmative conscience in the contemporary um, realm, and the idea that you know we need to protect affirmative conscience. So clinicians being penalized for providing care or not being supported for the consequences they face as in the same way that someone is protected from discrimination or penalty if they step away. So I want to ask you, when we think about pluralism in the United States, what happens if we center patient conscience rather than voter conscience or legislator conscience? And what happens if we respect conscientious provision as much as conscientious objection? I think that these are things that we could have robust conversations with our neighbors across the spectrum of opinions about the ethics or morality, um, whether it's from a secular perspective or a religious perspective about abortion care. Um, And I just want to leave you with this, because I work in a medical school, because um, I'm focused on patient care, according to ACOG, safe legal abortion is a necessary component of women's health. And do we believe that or not, regardless of what our legislatures say? Um, The only question in these current times of debates over bans is whether abortion is going to be safe or unsafe. Um, As Dr. Harris pointed out in that slide about Romania, the, the rates go back down. It's the maternal mortality that goes up. The only question will be, will it be a horrendous journey or will it be health care? Right. And, and I think it's pretty clear which side I would vote on for that. So I want to leave you with this thought. Um, to me, abortion bans are forced childbearing. It's a regime of forced childbearing. And that is often juxtaposed with pro-choice as these are the opposite positions, but that is a false dichotomy. The opposite of forced childbearing is forced childlessness. So that would be um, the imposition of sterilization programs. That would be like China's one child policy, right? Policies of coerced or forced abortions or sterilization or contraceptive use. Um, That is the opposite. What sits in the middle is folks who say, have as many children as you want, have as few children as you want, use whatever technologies or pharmaceuticals are seem ethically appropriate to you, or use whatever medical care. If you need millions of dollars in high-risk pregnancy medicine to carry that baby, even though it was recommended you have an abortion, we've got your back, right? We use our technology and our pharmaceuticals to put to support your reproductive vision. Um, To be pro-choice is not a stance on abortion exclusively. It's to be pro-conscience. It's to be pro-inclusion and equity. And it's to be pro-pluralism. And while I think many people feel um, passionately about abortion as being synonymous with freedom for people with capable of pregnancy, I think it's also bigger than that for many of us about what it stands for to live in a pluralistic country. Um, And that's why I think that the impending bans are so toxic because in addition to the one in four women 
who were predicted to have an abortion or need an abortion before menopause. They affect all fertile women because no one knows whether they will be the one or the three until they hit menopause. So taking so pleasure out of sex and replacing it with anxiety in states where one knows that their backup plan of abortion doesn't exist affects every fertile person. And then infertile people, I don't care whether you're a lesbian, a nun, or a postmenopausal woman, the symbolic violence of saying that the state thinks then the embryo that you created and nurture is more important than you are, affects everybody capable of pregnancy. And for queer people and people who use contraception or people who need IVF, the fear that they're coming for you next is profound. So this is, goes beyond abortion and I really think is a fight for freedom, conscience and inclusion. So I will end there and invite all any questions or discussion um, going forward. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Harris. So glad to have you here. I think I'm just going to log out. Jess is uh, Jess, Jessica Sanders, um, one of our Good. family planning faculty, is monitoring the chat situation and will provide us with some questions. I saw one um, from Nathan Blue, and maybe before we get to that, I just, um, we got through two fabulous talks and thank you both so, so much um, for devoting your time and fabulous intellectual energy um, toward sharing your current thoughts on abortion in the United States with us. Um, we got through those two talks without either of you mentioning the tension of opposites. <laughs> and um, a phrase that I think I learned first from Lisa and then reinforced uh, by Katie. And I think it, it's something that's really, uh, I don't know, maybe your thinking has evolved and doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't center this now, or maybe it still does. And I would like to hear your comments about that. Um, and I think it's just so helpful for other people in the audience that maybe haven't heard the phrase. I defer to Lisa. Oh, okay then. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, honestly, there was an extra section of my talk that I didn't get to because I went on too long in um, in the part that I did get to. And Dave, it was all about the tension of opposites. Um, <laughs> the tension of opposites is an idea that actually comes from Jungian psychoanalysis. And it's the idea that two seemingly opposite things can be true at the same time. And that's kind of what's true about abortion. And, and um, Professor Watson, Katie uh, talked about this too. I mean, it is true. Abortion means a baby will not be born. You know, abortion means a developing human um, will not continue to develop. And abortion means that someone will determine the course of their own life and their family's life. And both of those things are true at the same time. And, and that's why abortion is so hard as an issue is that two things are, are true at the same time. And in, in the reality is that 70 to 80% of people have some degree of internal conflict about abortion. They, they say, they feel they know a baby's not gonna be born and that feels weighty and maybe even wrong to put it in moral terms. And it also feels wrong to make that determination for someone else. And that's why people struggle with abortion. The problem is that in contemporary politics, social polarization benefits politicians. It, I don't know who else it benefits. And it serves them really, really well to maintain that polarization and not help people hold that tension. Uh, in my own research, I've seen that when you just model holding that tension, people can just go, oh my God, thank you. Yes, thank you for saying that. That's how I feel. It's this and it's this, but I don't have a space for that. And neither movement of you know abortion rights movement or anti-abortion movements have made space for people to hold both of these things. I think we would be a lot better off uh, if we could just do that and people could manage their own uncomfortable feelings about abortion rather than um, basically being vulnerable to the politicization of it because it drives people to um, the polls. If, if we could hold our own feelings about it, I don't think it would be the political issue it is because it just wouldn't be useful to politicians uh, they couldn't mobilize people around it. And when you can't mobilize people, it would it would cease to be 
um, a political issue. That's my hope and vision. Dave, did that cover what you wanted? I don't know if we was specifically addressed, um, you know, is that there is an element of this that is not, uh, you know, related to just what Lisa just said, you know, that this is not about abortion at all, that it's a very powerful political motivator and it's a very simple connection uh, and, and communication for people. Um, but, you know, this is about power mm -hmm. and communicating that in a way to explain it in a state where people who support this right, the full, you know, the right to have human right to have the full access to sexual and reproductive health care, um, really have no voice. We mm -hmm. have a veto proof majority mm -hmm. of extremely conservative people in all the state houses and, and the governor. And we really have no voice. It's not a democracy. Mm -hmm. So what are paths to power in that situation? How can we use what you all, you two have learned about communication mm -hmm. to dismantle that power or to change it? I don't know if I have like a fantastic political strategy. I have sort of a cultural observation, which is to keep in mind, we, we in medical ethics, we talk about new technologies like, oh, ventilators arrived. And then we had to think about all these new questions. And because abortion has been with us forever, we don't quite think of it the same way. But I try to frame it as a new technology in the sense of safe and highly effective abortion is relatively historically new. And its legalization then, of course, changed things. And so there has just been, historically speaking, such a radical amount of change in, let's say, 50, 60 years with woman-controlled contra oral contraception, um, that safe uh, and legal abortion, and the dramatic change in U.S. culture of women in higher education, women in the workforce, women in politics, um, and women, the changing in um, roles for mothering, delayed marriage, delayed childbearing, delayed, just later, not delayed, excuse me. Um, and so I think historically speaking, women only very recently have been able to do what men have been able to do for millennia, which is to have sex and not have a baby afterwards. And that's a really big cultural change. And the, uh, just to be very specific, white straight men have gained a tremendous amount by limiting the playing field. And when you open the playing field to people of color, to women, to queer people, um, suddenly that lower half of white straight men, they lose their position because the now medical schools are qualified women and full of qualified people of color. And, and, and it's threatening that, that just being white and male and straight isn't enough anymore to entitlement, to move to a real meritocracy is scary. Um, and so you live in a, of course, power, power holds on. And so it's not a path to fixing it. It's just a historical perspective to say that, of course, this is a fight. And of course, there is a backlash to all that that's happening now. And so the, I get out of bed in the morning by trying to say, that's how you know you're winning when they fight back hard, because when the, the power of social and institutional control is just happening under the radar, they can act very polite. Um, when it's not working anymore, they have to overtly fight back with these really awful draconian bans. Now that is not a path to changing that, but as you say, trying to find the paths to, it's partly convincing those people, but it's also partly replacing those people and dealing with the gerrymandering and the voter suppression. And when we have all these legislatures that don't, we see the polling on support for Roe, and then we see legislators going such a dramatically different way. It's very painful when you say, I don't live in a democracy. You're right. 
Um, so I think that um, I, another thing I keep saying these days is it's going to get worse before it gets better. And to me, both parts of that sentence are, are important to help people. And as Dr. Harris said, where you're like, where were you? <laughs> like, it's going to get worse. But I, I, I hope there will be a, is it a backlash? Is it a front lash when it goes to a backlash? I have no idea. But I hope there will be a, a, a turn of the time when people see, wait, that's not what we want. Right. It's going to be hard to endure. But to ride that momentum might be the answer or an answer. And just for the audience, you know, so it, it's consistent polling on the proportion of the U.S. population that favors overturning Roe is a, a quarter to a third. And the proportion of the U.S. population that supports Roe in full access, um, you know, to abortion is uh-huh. is well over a half and pushing 70, you know, closer to seven. Now, the rough part is when you ask people, what did Rose say? They don't really know. It stands for abortion access to people as a word. But then when you talk about viability and gestational age bands, it gets a little muddier. So one of the questions in the chat was um, the first one that I saw was a, a legal question. Sorry, um, Dr. Harris, anything to, to add on power and, and changing so that, the minor, so that the majority of people who respect the, the human right to the full range of sexual and reproductive health um, have access to it? I mean, I would go back, honestly, to the tension of opposites that you raised before. And you're correct that there's a 20 to 30% of the population who does not want abortion to be legal. And and then there's about that number who, no matter what the circumstances, would always support there being a right to abortion. And then there's all of these people in the middle, which is most of the people. And so it's, it's being able to have a conversation about abortion that helps those people that's needed. And, you know, I think that the comparison I would use is how marriage for same-sex couples, well, at least until... the the recent SCOTUS opinion, it kind of maybe is threatening that again, but it ceased to be a politically useful issue for legislators because people told their stories, gay people told their stories, their families told their stories, and people, the general population got good at managing whatever feelings they had about same-sex marriage. And it doesn't necessarily mean all wonderful feelings. It doesn't mean destigmatizing feelings, but whatever those feelings were, they just got good at holding and managing them this, themselves. And when that happens, the issue is not useful to politicians anymore. And so they stopped using it. And, and we're not seeing legislators campaign on um, for same-sex couples bans, or at least if, you know, if Roe goes, maybe we will see that again. But what the strategy that... Um, that advocates used that was ultimately successful was a strategy based in not in rights and it's my right and uh, this is a freedom. It's a strategy. It was a strategy based in stories that humanize people and got them to manage their own feelings about things so they're not vulnerable to the politicization of the issue. So that's that's what I think the strategy um, needs to be. This movement, but that means we have people. I say we. I, I not. I know there's a range of um, experiences and beliefs about abortion probably represented in the audience, but for people who want there to be shift, I think there needs to be some acceptance of the fact that not everyone likes abortion, not everyone wants to destigmatize abortion, and that can still lead to someone not wanting a, a ban on Roe. And I don't, I don't think honestly that pro-choice movements have um, been willing to kind of go into the, the muddiness. So um, thank you. One of the first questions in the, the chat was from one of our maternal fetal medicine docs, uh, Nathan Blue. And he was asking about, does the right to refuse medical care for the fetus, is that based in Roe? No. No, and in fact, Roe has been used to contradict that in states like Georgia, 
um, to say, well, you can't have an abortion after viability, therefore you have to submit to a forced cesarean. Um, Georgia's the only state Supreme Court that's held that. Um, but that is more of a common law right to refuse generally right um, that that unconsented touching is a form of assault and that if you're pregnant, that doesn't change your right to say no. Um, so if you think of abortion as an act of commission, interrupting a natural process that if uninterrupted would probably lead to a delivery, um, the refusal is an act of omission, allowing a natural process of potentially fetal demise or whatever the, the intervention is being recommended for happens. So, so row going would necessarily, from a legal perspective, change the right of pregnant people to refuse medical care. From a political and cultural perspective, it could push that direction because a sense of entitlement that um, in the same way Roe is sometimes deployed as, well, you couldn't get a post-viability abortion in this state. So somehow I feel, I, the clinician, somehow feel like you should have to submit to this treatment could start to happen throughout pregnancy. Um, ACOG's uh, ethics opinion on that is very strong that that's never warranted, regardless of what the law in one state says. I, I have a more pessimistic view. Please. Which, which is, I, 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 my view is a little more pessimistic that really the, you know, obviously women and pregnancy were not mentioned in the constitution. So the first real delineation, as I mentioned, of the rights of a person when there's another potential, another future person inside them was Roe. And it was further articulated in Casey. So I think if those opinions go, there's nowhere really that says that limits what the state can do in the interests of potential life. And mm -hmm. our, our current you know, laws that don't permit forced interventions like to remove bullets from prisoners or all of those other things, they won't apply because there's not a person inside another person. So, so I actually am really worried about um, the rights of, of pregnant women, of pregnant people, if row if row goes, I think Cara had a question. Yeah, I had a quick question to kind of build live on. audience member. <laughs> Hi, thank you both for your talk. They were um, amazing. My name is Cara Kieser. I'm one of the maternal fetal medicine um, physicians here. Um, and was that? I was just Lisa. Are you able to hear? I can sort of hear. I can sort of hear. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm Cara Huser. I'm one of the maternal fetal medicine physicians. Thank you for your talks. Um, my question kind of um, builds off of Nathan's question about viability. Um, we've talked a lot about Roe today. Um, and, in, and in my perception as a maternal fetal medicine physician, I think viability is a terrible um, medical and legal standard. Um, so do what is your opinion on um, if this will lead to, the only good thing I see about that opinion is that it did away with viability um, as a standard. Do, do we think that that will, once this, uh, once we, once things get better, after they get worse, um, do we think that people will move to abandoning that standard, which is a terrible standard? Do you, do you mind repeating? Yeah. Did you, did you, so I'm to repeat the question for the Zoom audience. Um, so the question is, um, do we think that the, the, the audience member thinks that um, viability is a terrible standard legally and medically, and the only good thing about the leaked opinion was it did away with that standard. And do we think that in the, uh, if the, the, my, my statement about things getting better comes true and that, era, we will um, also be done with the viability standard. Yes, is that is that a fair yes, paraphrasing? Way. No, no, just 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 shorter. Um, uh, Dr. Harris, do you want to speak to that or do you want? Uh, go, no, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. So I'm going to say, yes, the viability is, standard is terrible, except compared to all other standards. I'm actually a fan. If you're going to draw a line, um, it's the only one that takes into account the pregnant person and, and um, acknowledges that the fetus or embryo is dependent on her. 
um, and uses its potential independence as a time of change. Every other gestational limit, um, age limit, is based on um, some developmental point that has nothing to do with her. So the, the embryo or fetus could be living in an aquarium. Right. So, but I understand in practice. So we lawyers, we're used to cruel and unusual punishment. What does that mean? You know, it changes historically and systemically. And so I understand as a physician, the idea that it's left to physicians to say, what's a reasonable chance of a meaningful life is like, just, you know, that's, that's really hard to implement from a legal perspective. It's to me, because of that relational quality, it, it, it is least more respectful than many of the other lines. Um, and you could go to the third trimester to actual potential um, capacity to experience pain or cortical organization to potential for thinking. I mean, there are later lines too. Um, it is important to understand that Roe did not require states to ban abortion at viability. It permitted them to do so, and a handful of states didn't take the bait. So will we see going forward states just saying, oh, forget it. We got to get out of the abortion regulation business and just let people do what they need to do. I, I would advocate for that, um, for clarity. But in a world of patchwork bans, I'm going to be arguing like heck for viability as opposed to six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 15 weeks, because I do actually believe there's a, a logic with merit to it. Though, if it were up to me, I'd say no, no, no line because clinicians and patients need to work this out. Um, a point I've been making a lot frequently is for people um, uh, Lisa introduced me to Maggie Little's work on gradualism and the idea of the moral intuition that um, an embryo or fetus gains moral status as it grows. For people who are less comfortable with second trimester abortion than first trimester abortion, I keep saying the best policy agenda for you is to repeal the Hyde Amendment and repeal all abortion restrictions so people can get access as soon as they know they need it. And our second try abortion rate would go down some, right? If we took away, if we helped people remove all these barriers. Um, so the irony is in a world without any abortion regulations, including gestational age bans and limits to getting to the clinic or the hospital or wherever you need to go, um, we would actually see a little drop in when it happens. So to me, if you're looking for win-wins um, for people who are um, being sincere about their beliefs about abortion, and I want to separate that out from the sort of Trojan horse of misogyny and political power. And, you know, I'd fly my daughter anywhere, but I'm voting this way, right? That's, that's a different conversation. Um, but for the people who really are struggling with what Dr. Harris has described and um, that middle group, I think there's something there of just saying, could we get out of the regulation business entirely? Doesn't mean we can't try to persuade our neighbors of our views or to take into account things we think they've missed, but that's different than using the force of law. I mean, that kind of rational thinking really demonstrates, you know, I think supports that idea that this is not about abortion, yeah. right? Like if it was, then, um, you know, You'd, Clear. you'd fund all the child protection programs, you'd yeah, fund exactly. social welfare, yeah. you'd give full access to contraception. Yeah. We wouldn't be uh, the state with, you know, spending 50th among the states on per pupil mm -hmm. education. We wouldn't be the state with, you know, where women are earning 70 cents on the dollar mm -hmm. compared to men, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, and as we discussed, like, this is your moment to push for all those things and say, really, is it, these are your values? Right. Live them. Let's do this, RJ. Yeah. Let's, and we'll get, to, you know, we still want to address the right not to have children, but can we improve the right to have children in Utah? Right. And access to contraception. Can I add one be? thing to viability? Please. Yeah. So I, I, psychologically speaking, people really do need to know there are some moral or ethical guardrails uh, in abortion. And I think for some people that viability line provides that sense of security. I, I, I also see how that particular guardrail harms a lot of people who, um, for example, get late diagnoses of things, of fetal problems or other 
other things change, something changes and something goes wrong or something changes in their pregnancy. But I think the idea, I think it's really important to recognize that most people, when it comes to something that they're uncomfortable with, they want to know there's something there, some kind of guardrail, as I said. I personally would, I hope that if, for example, doctors who provide abortion care could talk about their work more and could be seen as moral agents along with patients who are making decisions to end pregnancies, that seeing that moral agency uh, in everybody involved would provide that sense of comfort or guardrail. It doesn't right now. And I think, you know, lots of people who provide abortion care don't have a voice for obvious reasons because of fear, stigma and fears of violence. And it's not necessarily fair to ask people ending pregnancies to provide that. But I do think we need to meet that need somehow. And if we don't have another way to meet it, I'll take viability because as you pointed out, Katie, it's better than six weeks or 10 weeks. But I do think that's a real, that's an okay thing for people to want there to be some limits and no, it's not gonna be that image, you know, of people deciding when, when they're in labor that they wanna end their pregnancy uh, by having an abortion. So I don't wanna diminish that idea that it's wrong to want some guardrails. Lisa, I have a question. I have a question about that. So, if there's yeah. thousands times more people who are having abortions than mm-hmm. people who are providing them, mm-hmm. why do you think that the message critically needs to come from the provider side? Isn't it, isn't it better coming from the user and recipient side? Well, it would be. I mean, sure, if people felt safe. To, to do that, but I, I'm not sure it's a fair thing to ask. And honestly, there aren't any evidence-based guidelines for how to share their voices. Patients should share voices in a way that will make a difference. In contrast, there are evidence-based recommendations for how care providers can share their voices in ways that makes a difference. So I would wanna see a research base before we kind of ask or require um, patients to share their experiences. I would want to know what it is that audiences actually need to hear from patients in order to shift them, because I think it's not really fair to ask them to have a voice in the absence of evidence-based recommendations for how to do that. And honestly, we don't we don't have that. But I do that think sounds like- I think the fact that care providers' voices have not adequately been in this, or when they are. They just sound like political pundits and they're trained the same way as politicians. I think that's been a problem and partly why we're in the boat that we're in. And I mean, you know, you saw it in the current draft opinion, but also the 2020, was it 2020 or 2021 opinion. I mean, the, the states and the justices are, are relying on erroneous negative stereotypes of people providing this care, what their motivations are. And we don't, we really need to correct those. Um, yeah. And so, so they, again, can't be the basis. It, it makes sense, right? If you think abortion care providers are really the evil people that are, are described, then of course, any good person would want to limit their practice or put constraints on it, right? That's what a normal good person does who's trying to do the right thing. So we really need to correct those flawed mental templates. Any questions? Oh, because we're going a little over. Yeah. I think we could give Bob a chance to kind of wrap oh, and then if you want to stay yes. on and continue the conversation because there have been really great cover or questions that have come up in the chat box. Um, I know we have you here in person. Um, and if we can stay on a little bit longer, we can maybe keep the conversation going, but um, just to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you for saying that. Yes, my apologies. Uh, thank you so much. Um, if you're game to continue the conversation, but uh, (laughs) we will cede the floor to uh, our chair, uh, Dr. Bob Silver of the OBGYN department. Thank you. um, Bob, are you going to magically appear? There it is. Awesome. On on Zoom. Um, So uh, firstly, uh, uh, just in relation to this session, I'd really like to, to thank uh, Professors uh, Harris and Watson. Those were fantastic talks, and you can see that almost everybody is, is still here uh, o- over time, and I think they want to stay. So uh, clearly, uh, you've, you've stimulated a lot of really important discussion, um, and, and so thank you for, for, for joining us, and thanks to Dave Turok for inviting you and getting you to, to, to spend some time with us. So really appreciate it. 
Uh, I'd also just like to congratulate the entire group uh, on, the, on the whole day. And uh, as always, uh, this conference uh, doesn't function without Landon Johnston, who just makes sure that the uh, trains run on time and Done and it's all magic. So uh, a big shout out to, to Leanne, um, and uh, she's been for this. And then also uh, a, a shout out to uh, Kathleen Degree and, and Mike Barner. Um, this is uh, really a, a, a passion project for them. And uh, thanks to the uh, the very large number of folks who are still engaged, hoping to talk to Professor Harrison Watson more about this. So. Congratulations on a great day. Thanks to all and, and uh, uh, everybody who's uh, got an interest, uh, please stay on and keep going. If, uh, if, you, uh, if you guys are willing, uh, uh, I think there's still more questions. So thank you. Awesome, can I ask one of the questions that came up? There's, there are a few questions from the chat box. Um, so one of the questions from Dr. Lissomo, so trying to interpret Alito's opinion in good faith as a legitimate counter to the constitutionality of the right of abortion to abortion, but not knowing much about constitutional law nor past court precedent. Um, the impression is that it's just a piece of motivational reasoning, but could you clearly state this hypothesis? How is a right to abortion not a constitutional right under the auspices of the right to privacy like other rights? not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, but granted. Mm -hmm. um, so Justice Alito is playing a shell game. Um, so how you pose the question of the case usually dictates the answer to the case. And how you frame the level of granularity um, with which you frame the right in question. And so I'm going to use one of the precedents he cites. Uh, to illustrate this. In Bowers versus Hardwick in 1986, a horrible case it, that challenged um, the criminalization of same-sex sexual contact, which was called sodomy in these statutes, said that can't, that's unconstitutional. Roe has happened. We should have a privacy right to consensual adult sexual expression. Um, and um, the court ruled, no, that's not a, there is no constitutional right to sodomy and did this um, a substance due process analysis, which says the right has to be um, deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. And did this analysis that sodomy has been illegal for, you know, since the colonies. Um, then in um, 2003 in Lawrence versus Texas, the court said we got it wrong because we misunderstood what was at stake. It wasn't sex, it wasn't sodomy, it was love. It was adult romance and relationship and sexual expression, which has been protected in all our cases about marriage and all our cases about contraception and, and abortion and privacy and so on. So I use that example for two reasons. One is because if you say the right to abortion um, well, it has been, um, it was in the mid 1800s, the, the statutes got more specific and more aggressive. Um, so there hasn't been a right to abortion. You know, if, if you discuss it that way, the technologies and medical procedures and pharmaceuticals we have also, we didn't have that. Right. So, so how do you have a living constitution that changes where you can say cruel and unusual punishment and you don't change the phrase, but you update the application for the current moment, right, to fit the current culture. Um, so what Alito did was pick abortion itself versus what it accomplishes or represents um, to people right in their lives. So he did that analysis to say it's not firmly grounded or deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition was, was the analysis. Now his claim that, well, therefore um, you don't need to worry about the contraception cases or the gay rights cases, because what distinguishes them is the presence of another potential person distinguishes the abortion cases is why I said it's a fetal rights argument about protecting embryos and fetuses, because the framers were not thinking about embryos and fetuses. So his claim to have a sort of originalism is really false. Um, it's really um, 
a vehicle for imposing the moral beliefs or allowing the imposition of the moral beliefs of five members of the court. The second reason I mentioned the transition from Bowers to Lawrence is it really deeply troubles me that this idea that like, yes, the Supreme Court can reverse its own precedents, right? That happens. But if you track those cases, they, the reversals are in the direction of more liberty, of more rights for more people. And when they say we got it wrong, they say we didn't understand the right we didn't understand what was at stake before or times have changed. And so when they go from Plessy versus Ferguson of separate can be equal to Brown versus board, separate is never equal. It's a, it's a represents a cultural shift in an opening of imagination and towards a more inclusive America there. I do not know of a time where they took rights back and, or did something you could argue with the economic cases like West coast hotel that they, the, when they said people have a freedom to contract. So we're canceling, you know, we're striking these minimum wage laws or limitations on working hours, but they went the other direction, but it was still a protective move. Um, so that feels disingenuous to me or a willful ignorance of that pattern, that it's a retraction of rights. The only way you can justify it in the case run that he cites is if you think of it as an extension of rights to embryos and fetuses, right? Um, it's not named as such, but I think between the lines, that's what's happening. And that's why those five justices feel like if you take them, as I appreciate the, the writer said in the, with, um, in, in good faith, that they feel like this is also an expansion of rights or opening the door for some states to expand rights, though they don't name it as such. And, and that's what's disingenuous as a piece of constitutional work. So speaking of disingenuous and illegitimate, <laughs> what about the fact that you know at least two of those five justices lied to get on the court, if not all five? Like, is that not is there not some grounding for that kind of illegitimacy? Well, that's called impeachment, and and you could talk to the current Congress about that. Um, it's not going to happen. Um, they said Roe was precedent, and they, I mean, I'm not going to defend them for, I mean, I think they lied, but um, they crafted those sentences very carefully, if you look at them, of Roe is precedent, um, because as an appellate judge, you're supposed to follow that. As a Supreme Court justice, if you believe the five-part criteria for reversing a precedent has been met, you, you can. Um, now, like Kavanaugh didn't respect Roe, Coney Barrett didn't respect Roe as appellate judges. So I don't know why anyone felt fooled by that. Um, yeah. Bye. Should we wrap up? I think. We good? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you again. This was really um, wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you. We'd like to thank you on behalf of the Center of Excellence in Women's Health for all the people who have attended today and spent the entire day with us, or at least since noon. Don't forget to get to the poster sessions. There's some really good stuff there too. And thank you so much to our speak, our guest speakers, Dr. Harris and um, Watkins. And we're so honored that you were with us today. This was really wonderful. Uh, uh, Dr. Watson, I, we, I, I'd like to nominate you to the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Well, right? when, you are, when you're president, I'll vote for you. Okay. And then we'll talk. Oh, thank you. That's so kind of you. Well, President is. I'll be in the Supreme Court of the Echo Center. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you so, thanks so much. much. Bye, Lisa. Bye. So lovely to see folks. Bye. Thank you so much.